because so i got trained you know i got equipped i understood what i really wanted to do beyond passion there's a huge innovation gap on the continent you have young people who are talented and largely driven by passion who go into starting enterprises without the requisite skills, knowledge, resources, relationships to be able to take them uh, sustainably. We couldn't sustain the programs we did. We lacked financial capacity. You know, it was just at the point where I was almost going to stop the idea. The SIP, Social Innovators Program, was designed so that we can bridge that gap. We can fill that gap of capacity. Indirectly, when they invested in me as a young person, they've invested in the over 11,000 plus women that we've been able to empower. We were able to provide relief materials to um, over 3,000 inmates. For just the last three years, after being a leaf pillow, we have been able to achieve that goal to the highest level we can think about. We have 5,000 volunteers subscribed to Volunteering Their Time this year on different projects happening around Africa. During this week-long campaign, you can expect to see us in your neighborhood, painting your schools, painting hospitals, giving food at the orphanages. We're really excited to be here this morning 
Um, lots of our team members are here, and it's part of our way at Leap Africa of giving back to our community uh, in commemoration of the Youth Day of Service. We're really changing the narrative across Africa this year that young people, no matter how young you are, you can really be a big part of change. It goes to say that without the youth of today, there is no way we can achieve lasting social impact. Leap Africa that makes this to happen in this our community. This is the force of its kind in our community. So at Leap Africa, we appreciate you. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. <laughs>
Leave Africa really changed my life, and I can say that I've really learned a lot. One of the main things I learned is you do not need to be in a position to be a leader. You just need to take charge, be who you are, and stand for what is right, and your followers will come. Very grateful to Leap Africa for the SIP program. It was very inspiring, and um, I think what I really enjoyed about it was not so much about the Leap Africa and the great um, speakers that came to talk to us. It was more about the inspiring stories of fellow change makers around me, 20 of us who were doing amazing things. I mean, I was more inspired to know that I wasn't alone. There were other great Nigerians who were doing wonderful things. So I think um, the greatest thing that I think I took out of the Leap Africa program is that running an NGO, you shouldn't think about running it as a non-profit. You should think in terms of running it as a for-profit so that that way you can maximize resources and also uh, maximize your, should I say, your growth and also um, impact. I'm so excited and, and I'm very, very grateful for Leap Africa for this social entrepreneurship program because it's exactly what I needed. When I applied, I kept asking myself, like, uh, do I really need this? But I knew deep down that I was really struggling between my business model and my impact. And what I got is, uh, during this period of days, uh, it was exactly what I needed to get. I've been asking a lot of questions, you know. I got everything I needed, and I even get more, and I'm actually looking forward to use it. So I'm really grateful for Leap Africa and for our facilitators. Starting from this year, we don't want International Youth Day to just be about conversations of convenience. We want it to be about action. Hello world, and um, welcome to the Youth Day of Service, where young people are being youthful and useful. The whole idea of this is that on our continent, we have young people. Young people full of energy, full of creativity, and we feel like these numbers, these energies should be channeled towards something positive. We are inspiring, empowering and equipping youth and entrepreneurs with information, skills and tools for transformational leadership that will impact our society. We are broadening the horizon for our youth and positioning them to live productive, successful and principled lives. Supporting entrepreneurs in creating legacies and business by instituting systems and structures that are crucial for sustainability. We're creating an e-resource center for the development of both youth and business owners across the continent to meet the 21st century socio-economic and technological demands. We are creating a new Africa. We are lit. Africa, there were no other leadership development organizations across the continent that we could look to as examples. So we had to look to organizations around the world. I think that LEAP has created that niche for itself as, you know, a leader in building the capacity of youth. As an organization that has truly influenced positively the ecosystem of youth development and youth leadership. Lots of those who've been inspired by LEAP have either set up some organization or some project leading change in different organizations where they find themselves. If we're able to replicate that and multiply that across Nigeria, then Paraventure will stand a chance as a nation to truly get back on our right trajectory. We have so many of those young people across Nigeria, across Africa, who can trace their stories to LEAP. And that really was our vision, to create an army of change agents across the continent who will uplift this continent so we can stand shoulder to shoulder with other continents around. And I'm proud to say that we have played a pivotal role in that transition. There's a huge innovation gap in, in, on the continent. 
you have young people who are talented and largely driven by passion who go into starting enterprises without the requisite skills, knowledge, resources, relationships to be able to take them uh, sustainably transgenerationally. And so the SIP, Social Innovators Program, was designed so that we can bridge that gap. We can fill that gap of capacity and resources for young people. One key thing I credit the LEAP SIP, for, the SIP for is helping me figure out that we need a structure. I had to dissolve the board, current board we had and set up a new board, so based on things I learned during the program. You know, so joining the SIP was a transformation. You know, I understood what I wanted to do, I understood structures, so I got trained. You know, I got equipped. I understood what I really wanted to do beyond passion. There's a huge innovation gap on the continent. You have young people who are talented and largely driven by passion who go into starting enterprises without the requisite skills, knowledge, resources, relationships to be able to take them uh, sustainably. We couldn't sustain the programs we did. We lacked financial capacity. You know, it was just at the point where I was almost going to stop the idea. The SIP, Social Innovators Program, was designed so that we can bridge that gap. We can fill that gap of capacity. Indirectly, when they invested in me as a young person, they've invested in the over 11,000 plus women that we've been able to empower. We're able to provide relief materials to um, over 3,000 inmates. For just the last three years, after being a leaf fellow, we are able to achieve that goal to the highest level we can think about.
different projects happening around Africa. During this week-long campaign, you can expect to see us in your neighborhoods, painting your schools, painting hospitals, giving food at the orphanages. We're really excited to be here this morning. Um, lots of our team members are here, and it's part of our way at Leap Africa of giving back to our community uh, in commemoration of the Youth Day of Service. We're really changing the narrative across Africa this year that young people, no matter how young you are, you can really be a big part of change. It goes to say that without the youth of today, there is no way we can achieve lasting social impact. I'm just want to say a very big thank you to them. Leap Africa that makes this to happen in this our community. This is the force of its kind in our community. So at Leap Africa, we appreciate you. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. Our vision of Africa is one where our continent's potentials are fully realized through citizens who have cultivated leadership effectiveness, accountability, and professionalism. This is LIP. In Africa, we are in a, we're in a very interesting time. We're in a very interesting time in our history, and it's interesting because in every country on the continent, we have more than 20 to 30 percent of young people constituting uh, part of the entire population and if if this youth board is is harnessed effectively or if this youth board is seen as capital right it has the opportunity to kickstart or jumpstart africa's you know economic narrative leap africa has been developing leaders motivated to deliver positive change I was really inspired by the state of affairs in Africa. Um, my conviction that we needed a new generation of credible, innovative, honest people who had a vision for how to move this continent forward and who would work diligently to inspire others to do that. Leap Africa has a, a business leadership program that I participated in about five years ago. I founded a company called House of Tara, an indigenous beauty company. And I started off as an undergraduate in university. At the time I went on the program, I, I felt that I wanted more. I felt I wanted more for the business. I wanted the business to become sustainable. And going through that program, one of the impacts was I learned that um, structure is the vehicle for sustainable business, for building a sustainable business. I also came out of, of the program with a desire and a knowledge the, for the importance of core values. Every organization needs to have its own core values, what their ethos are, what, what are the guiding principles of each business. And I built, I sat down my 40s to run, it was part of the exercise of the, of the class. And um, today I'm building the business, being conscious of, of who's going to be next in line and who's going to take over from me. So it's a question of planning, um, structure as a vehicle or platform for sustainable growth were two things that I took away from that program. I was 17 years when I started the Youth Leadership Program with you. And there's a particular segment we had during the Youth Leadership Program. And the conversation said, picture yourself in your funeral ceremony. What will people say about you? That segment was lasted for five minutes, and that has really inspired me to start up an initiative called Brightest Organization. Our mission is to inspire and empower students for a brighter future and to live a disciplined life. And through this initiative, I've been able to inspire young people by 
by way of getting scholarship and get helping them get professional jobs and skills. Leave Africa really changed my life and I can say that I've really learned a lot. One of the main things I learned is you do not need to be in a position to be a leader. You just need to take charge, be who you are and stand for what is right and your followers will come. Very grateful to Leap Africa for the SIP program. It was very inspiring and um, I think what I really enjoyed about it was not so much about the Leap Africa and the great um, speakers that came to talk to us. It was more about the inspiring stories of fellow change makers around me, 20 of us who were doing amazing things. I mean, I was more inspired to know that I wasn't alone. There were other great Nigerians who were doing wonderful things. So I think um, the greatest thing that I think I took Social media is also the air that terrorists and bandits breathe. So, what is the common good? What has been shown that on central social media, it is the TGP part to commit vices, inciting them to commit vices, increasing the criminal and mortality rate of the land, reducing the progress and development in states. What is the common good? What we have shown that on central social media for a nation that wants to be in peace and unity has caused inter ethnic discord. Ladies and gentlemen, parents are not God. Uncensored social media has been shown to corrupt the children. So when our dream is to eradicate corruption, uncensored social media, if we leave it, we corrupt the children. What would our future be like? Ladies and gentlemen, before I leave you, I would like to say that I, Ojoaya Akolani, would rather wash myself and wash my mouth and not speak in situations where I'm not intended to than have my mouth shut for me forcefully, violently, and permanently. Thank you for listening. Mr. Chair and Honorable Members, to add injury to insult, having forcefully instituted the IPPI's platform, which cuts the, the lecturers of all benefits due them according to the terms of the 2019 agreement, the government also underpaid many lecturers, paying some as low as 6,000 naira. This obvious failure of IPPI still did not motivate the government to adopt UTAS, an indigenous invention which has been proposed even by the government to work. I would like to bring to the knowledge of this house that regular pay and not increase in pay is the big bone of contention. Please, house, is that too much to ask? An important part I would like to bring to the, to the knowledge of this house is a good of a good working environment is adequate remuneration, which not only deals with the financial needs of the worker, but also the psychological safety that financial buoyancy confers. Robbing these lecturers of their financial rights, of their financial power, not only hampers their efficiency at work, but also exposes their students to undue harassment from the lecturers. Thank you. Our vision of Africa is one where our continent's potentials are fully realized through citizens who have cultivated leadership effectiveness, accountability, and professionalism. This is LIP. In Africa, we are in a, we're in a very interesting time. We're in a very interesting time in our history, and it's interesting because in every country on the continent, we have 
more than 20 to 30 percent of young people constituting uh, part of the entire population and if if this youth board is is harnessed effectively or if this youth board is seen as capital right it has the opportunity to kickstart or jumpstart africa's you know economic narrative leap africa has been developing leaders motivated to deliver positive change i was really inspired by the state of affairs in africa um, my conviction that we needed a new generation of credible innovative honest people who had a vision for how to move this continent forward and who would work diligently to inspire others to do that leap africa has a, a business leadership program that i participated in about five years ago I founded a company called House of Tara, an indigenous beauty company, and I started off as an undergraduate in university. At the time I went on the program, I, I felt that I wanted more. I felt I wanted more for the business. I wanted the business to become sustainable. And going through that program, one of the impacts was I learned that um, structure is the vehicle for sustainable business, for building a sustainable business. I also came out of, of the program with a desire and a knowledge the, for the importance of core values. Every organization needs to have its own core values, what their ethos are, what, what are the guiding principles of each business. And I built, I sat down my four fifty one. it was part of the exercise of the, of the class. And um, today I'm building the business, being conscious of, of who's going to be next in line and who's going to take over from me. So sequential planning, um, structure as a vehicle or platform for sustainable business were two things that I took away from that program. I was 17 years when I started the Youth Leadership Program with you. And there's a particular segment we had during the Youth Leadership Program. And the facilitator said, picture yourself in your funeral ceremony. What will people say about you? That segment was lasted for five minutes, and that has really inspired me to start up an initiative called Bright It Organization. Our mission is to inspire and empower students for a brighter future and to live a disciplined life. And through this initiative, I've been able to inspire young people by way of getting scholarship and get, helping them get professional jobs and skills. Leap Africa really changed my life, and I can say that I've really learned a lot. One of the main things I learned is you do not need to be in a position to be a leader. You just need to take charge, be who you are, and stand for what is right and your followers will come. Very great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. All right, we'll be starting shortly. Um, thank you very much for coming in right early. Uh, we just want to wait for some few guests to come in and we'll start. Thank you very much.
world vision of Africa is one where our continent's potentials are fully realized through citizens who have cultivated leadership effectiveness, accountability, and professionalism. This is LIP. In Africa, we are in a, we're in a very interesting time. We're in a very interesting time in our history, and it's interesting because in every country on the continent, we have more than 20 to 30 percent of young people constituting uh, part of the entire population. And if if this youth board is is harnessed effectively, or if this youth board is seen as capital, right, it has the opportunity to kickstart or jumpstart Africa's, you know, economic narrative. Leap Africa has been developing leaders motivated to deliver positive change. I was really inspired by the state of affairs in Africa. Um, my conviction that we needed a new generation of credible, innovative, honest people who had a vision for how to move this continent forward and who would work diligently to inspire others to do that. Leap Africa has a, a business leadership program that I participated in about five years ago. I founded a company called House of Clara, an indigenous beauty company, and I started off as an undergraduate in the university. At the time I went on the program, I, I felt that I wanted more. I felt I wanted more for the business. I wanted the business to become sustainable. And going through that program, one of the impacts was I learned that um, structure is a vehicle for sustainable business, for building a sustainable business. I also came out of, of the program with a desire and a knowledge for the importance of core values. Every organization needs to have its own core values, what their issues are, what, what are the guiding principles of each business. And I built, I sat down my 40 to run, it was part of the exercise of, of the class. And um, today I'm building the business, being conscious of, of who's going to be next in line and who's going to take over from me. So succession planning, um, structure as a vehicle or platform for sustainable business were two things that I took away from that program. I was 17 years when I started the Youth Leadership Program with Leap. And there's a particular segment we had during the Youth Leadership Program. And the facilitators said, picture yourself in your funeral ceremony. What will people say about you? That segment was lasted for five minutes, and that has really inspired me to start up an initiative called Bright It Organization. Our mission is to inspire and empower students for a brighter future and to live a disciplined life. And through this initiative, I've been able to inspire young people by way of getting scholarship and get, helping them get professional jobs and skills. Leap Africa really changed my life and I can say that I've really learned a lot. One of the main things I learned is you do not need to be in a position to be a leader. You just need to take charge, be who you are and stand for what is right and your followers will come. Very grateful to Leap Africa for the SIP program. It was very inspiring and um, I think what I really enjoyed about it was not so much about the Leap Africa and the great um, speakers that came to talk to us, it was more about the inspiring stories of fellow change makers around me, 20 of us who were doing amazing things. I mean, I was more inspired to know that I wasn't alone. There were other great Nigerians who were doing wonderful things. So I think um, the greatest thing that I think I took out of the Leap Africa program is that running an NGO, you shouldn't think about running it as a non-profit, you should think in terms of running it as a for-profit, so that that way you can maximize resources and also uh, maximize your, should I say, your growth and also um, impact. I'm so excited and, and I'm very, very grateful for Leap Africa for this social entrepreneurship program because it's exactly what I needed. When I applied, I kept asking myself like, uh, do I really need this? But I knew deep down that I was really struggling between my business model and my impact. And what I got is uh, during this period of days, it was exactly what I needed to get. I've been asking a lot of questions, you know, I got every everything I needed and I even get more and I'm actually looking forward to use it so I'm really grateful for Leap Africa and for our facilitators.
starting from this year, we don't want International Youth Day to just be about conversations or convenings. We want it to be about action. Hello all, and um, welcome to the Youth Day of Service, where young people are being youthful and useful. The whole idea of this is that on our continent, we have young people. Young people full of energy, full of creativity, and we feel like these numbers, these energies should be channeled towards something positive. We are inspiring, empowering, and equipping youth and entrepreneurs with information, skills, and tools for transformational leadership that will impact our society. We are broadening the horizon for our youth and positioning them to live productive, successful, and principled lives. Supporting entrepreneurs in creating legacies and business by instituting systems and structures that are crucial for sustainability. We're creating an e-resource center for the development of both youth and business owners across the continent to meet the 21st century socio-economic and technological demands. We are creating a new Africa. We are lit. started Leap Africa, there were no other leadership development organizations across the continent that we could look to as examples. So we had to look to organizations around the world. I think that Leap has created that niche for itself as, you know, a leader in building the capacity of youth. It's an organization that has truly influenced positively the ecosystem of youth development and youth leadership. Lots of those who've been inspired by Leap have either set up some organization or some projects leading change in different organizations where they find themselves. If we're able to replicate that and multiply that across Nigeria, then Paraventure will stand a chance as a nation to truly get back on our right trajectory. We have so many of those young people across Nigeria, across Africa, who can trace their stories to LEAP. And that really was our vision, to create an army of change agents across the continent who will uplift this continent so we can stand shoulder to shoulder with other continents around the world. And I'm proud to say that we have played a pivotal role in that transition. There's a huge innovation gap in, in, on the continent. You have young people who are talented and largely driven by passion who go into starting enterprises without the requisite skills, knowledge, resources, relationships to be able to take them uh, sustainably transgenerationally and so the SIP social innovators program was designed so that we can bridge that gap we can fill that gap of capacity and resources for young people. One key thing I credit the LEAP SIP for, the SIP for is helping me figure out that we need a structure. I had to dissolve the board, current board we had and set up a new board so based on things I learned during the program. You know so joining the SIP was a transformation you know, I understood what I wanted to do, I understood structures, so I got trained, you know, I got equipped, I understood what I really wanted to do beyond passion. Good morning. Good All right, morning. thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. And it's so good to see your beautiful faces. Uh, we want to especially welcome all our special guests, our past and present board members, the chairman of the board, the founder of Leap Africa, and all our friends and colleagues and staff. You're welcome. Put a round of applause for yourself one more time for making it right and early. And just say a warm welcome to the person sitting close to you and say welcome, welcome. Get to know their name, you know, so you don't see close to a stranger. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome to the 2022 SIPA. 
It's my honor to be here, but just before we commence, may I ask that we please rise for the national anthem of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and at the same time, we will welcome Gift, who will help with the rendition. A round of applause for Gift, please. Thank you. Federal Republic of Nigeria. You may please be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick um, security briefing and exit protocols, just to say that we have exits at 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, we have a muster point just right at the back and on the second exit on my right. The restroom is just down the corridor. When you go to your right, all the way down, take your left, and the restroom will just be at the right. Um, we have a medical team on standby. Should you need any medical attention, please just call one of the ushers and they'll be there to assist you. Also, please note that this is a public event, so please take very good care of your devices and personal items because you don't want anyone missing. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I'd love to warmly welcome you all to the 2022 Social Innovators Program and Awards by Leap Africa. 
Now, the SIPA is a platform that showcases and celebrates young social change makers between the ages of 18 and 35 years, whose ideas and initiatives offer effective solutions to challenges in local communities across Africa. Through SIPA, Leap Africa is increasing awareness of the innovative solutions of young Africans, equipping and empowering them with the requisite skills and effective tools for building sustainable social enterprises. Now, since 2013, Leap Africa, in collaboration with its partners, has supported over 200 talented social innovators. Now, when you hear 200 social innovators, there is a ripple effect, so we don't know the exact number, so we have them in thousands and thousands. So today we're celebrating Leap Africa for their impact in Africa. Thank you, Leap Africa. I thought we would applaud them at this point. Thank you. So they've actively supported over 200 talented social innovators who are on the path to building sustainable enterprises and help them scale their impact, leveraging the framework of the global goals. Their solutions cover diverse sectors and aspects of development, such as agriculture, education, science and technology, gender, empowerment, health, energy, environment, and sanitation. The SIP Awards concludes the fellowship year and is hosted to amplify the impact of young social innovators across Africa, whose initiatives have improved the livelihoods of millions across the nation in Africa. It's also a conference to inspire more young people present in the room, you know, to take action irrespective of their economic status, cultural background, social positioning, and call attention to the opportunities and gaps in social entrepreneurship in Africa. It's a conference to tell us that there's a, there's a strength in one and the power of many. My name is Daniel Emeno. I'm a program manager, a content creator, and a professional MC host. And I'm co-hosting this event with the amazing Mojibadi. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. My name is Mojibadi Shosoya. I am a compare and a media and communications executive. Much more than being a compare, I am your compare today and I am delighted to be here. We are reaching you live from Lagos, Nigeria because we understand that people are joining us from different parts of the world. Again, we welcome you to what promises to be an amazing event. You know, it's a very special day, especially because we're celebrating 20 years 20 years, 20 years, I was waiting for the applause. 20 years of raising leaders, transforming Africa. So we're celebrating transformational impact as well as redefining Africa. What a great time to be alive. So if you're here, put a round of, give yourself a round of applause for making it here today because we have special things on the agenda for you. We'd like to acknowledge our massive online audience joining us today, and we want to say a very big welcome to you. Please, audience of the room, can we welcome our online audience? They can't hear you. They can't hear you. Make it louder. Thank you very much for joining us all over the world. We hope that you're going to have a fantastic event, um, irrespective of your location. If you're on the online platform for this conference, we plan to ensure you have a seamless virtual experience today without feeling you're missing anything by not being here physically. The online platform will give you the opportunity to network with other exciting people from across Africa. So network is not just going to happen in the room, it's also happening online. And this is how it works, all right? During the networking, the platform will randomly assign you to network with someone for two minutes and will assign you to another person so you get to meet several people in the course of the conference. The platform will give you the option to request a networking, a networking session with anybody or any guest of your choice and the person will have to approve for the networking session to happen. If it doesn't get approved, just move on to the next person. Don't take it personal. All right, there's so many other people out there in the online platform that you need to network with. The beautiful thing about technology is that you also get the opportunity to meet our partners and sponsors virtually through the virtual booth. So feel free. 
Sahara Group and Ford Foundation. Thank you. I was going to ask you to applaud them, but I love the energy in the room. Thank you for being very proactive and celebrating our key sponsors for today. As we go on, again, we live in a social era, so we want you to post pictures. When you catch something that strikes you when we have the keynote sessions, the panel sessions, the conversations going on, please post on social media and use the hashtag LeapSIPA2022. That is L-E-A-P-S-I-P-A-2022. When we walked in, we saw people taking pictures already. So please make sure you're posting on Instagram, Twitter, using the hashtag LeapSIPA2022. We would also love for you to tweet at us, share your thoughts, your comments on the conversations, and let the world know what is going on right here in Lagos, Nigeria. We want to reach every single person. So people that are not here feel like they're missing something and they want to join us virtually. So please tweet at us at Leap Africa, at Leap Africa. Again, on Instagram, we are Leap Africa as well. So if you're posting and you would like to tag us on social media, use Leap Africa. Thank you very much. In the words of Anika Horn, social entrepreneurs bring so much passion, but to sustain that passion over years and years, you must refill. That brings us to today. Our theme is reawaken, redesign, re-emerge Africa beyond potential. So to sustain that momentum, conversations like this are very necessary. Today promises to be very insightful, interesting, and engaging. We have something fun for you. I mean, so not just all conversations, conversations. We have entertainment for you. Of course, we have our keynote address, but before then, we would have members of the team officially welcome us. We'll have speed talk sessions. We will have several performances, and then we have a panel conversation where we get to ask questions as well from our distinguished speakers. So we haven't just brought random people, we've brought thought leaders and very distinguished speakers who will be on the panel conversation today. Daniel, I'm looking forward to an amazing time. Same here, same here. You know, Leap Africa is part of my story. I started my career working in Leap Africa, and here I am I now. Clap for me now. <laughs> Please celebrate my co-host. A proud and product of Leap Africa. Fantastic. And Leap Africa is a part of so many, many stories. Either working in Leap or being part of our programs, Leap Africa continues to change life. And we're not just here for this conference, we're also here to celebrate 20 years of Leap's existence in Nigeria and in Africa. Round of applause one more time for Leap Africa. <laughs> Leap Africa is a non-profit leadership development organization focused on raising leaders to transform Africa. Leap Africa provides relevant and tailored interventions that support effective youth transitions in the areas of education, entrepreneurship, employability, civic participation, and social mobility for young Africans. To take us further in this conference, ladies and gentlemen, please, let's welcome Leap Africa's Director of Programs, Annabelle Owamaka, to give us the welcome address. The louder you clap, the faster she comes. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for gracing our hall today with your presence. Um, it's really good to see all of you gathered here, and thank you for taking the time out of your busyness. I know it might not look that way because we clean up good at Leap Africa, but so much effort, energy, time, sleepless nights have gone into putting this event together. And we're all like in a bit of a celebratory mood because we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So please, a round of applause. And uh, this, we're also welcoming our 10th cohort of our Social Innovators Program, which I think is excellent, so please. Thank you. As has been said by the MCs, the Social Innovators Program was conceived to provide you know, tools, skills, resources, knowledge to exceptional change makers across the continent who were doing work and probably needed an avenue, a platform to scale their, and to reach more people. And over the past 10 years, we've been 
basically providing, build, bridging that knowledge gap for these exceptional people. So we're very proud of this event where we get to acknowledge them, where we get to showcase what they're doing. And we're very glad to be able to share that time with you. I would like to use this opportunity to welcome our speakers, our board members, our esteemed guests, our partners. Special thank you to Union Bank and Sahara Group and Ford Foundation for your support over the years and making this happen. Without you, we probably would not be able to do this. So thank you so much. A round of applause for our partners and sponsors. Thank you. So this year, our theme is Reawaken, Redesign, and Reemerge, Africa Beyond Potential. So if we, as we reflected over the past 20 years and even 10 years of Social Innovators Program, you know, we're, we live in a context where the world is facing unique challenges and there needs to be sort of a reflection and a reimagining of what it means to innovate and and to have impact on our continent. How can we do more? How can we reach more? How can we harness and, and, and grow our locally sourced innovators to get them to be more global change makers? And that's some of the things that we would like to reflect on and unpack over the course of this moment, this um, morning. And so to that end, we have an exciting lineup of activities, of speakers, of panelists, and entertainments. So I look forward to being inspired alongside all of you and to just having a great time. So welcome once again. Thank you for coming. And I look forward to having a wonderful time with you all. One more time, a round of applause for Amabel for our opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, our online audience, if you have any challenges, please indicate in the comments, and a member of the tech team will attend to you. There's a massive audience online, so don't waste this opportunity to meet incredible like-minded people. And also in the room, um, it's, a, it's a chance to also network and meet the incredible set of people in the room. We have water, tea, and drinks at the back, so during the conference, just feel free to walk there and just have one. For the opening remarks, is another inspiring leader, which is a chief brand and marketing officer at Union Bank, our official and long-standing sponsor of the Social Innovators Program and Words. Union Bank has worked with Leap Africa to support the growth and development of Nigerians as well as African social innovators since 2014. A round of applause one more time for Union Bank under the sustainability arm of the bank. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome with a resounding applause of Gotchuku Ikeze Ikaidem to take the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hold on. Let me try to. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see everybody this morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, on the 20th anniversary for LEAP. Uh, congratulations to the team, and I'm um, glad to be giving the opening remarks. So good morning, guests, um, fellows, distinguished guests, fellows, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Union Bank, I would like to welcome you to the SIP um, Awards. Um, by uh, Leap Africa. I'm always excited and humbled when I can make this um, event because it always reminds me of the potential and the opportunities that exist um, in our country and especially with our youth. Um, I'm especially excited this year, of course, because of the 20th um, anniversary celebration. And I personally want to acknowledge um, Ndidi Wunelli, who, um, because of her passion, um, we are here today. Um, Ndidi and I are friends. Uh, we are co-fellows of the same fellowship, and our paths and lives intersect in different um, um, areas. And in every space, Ndidi, you are always an inspiration. And it is part of your vision, and it's your vision that we celebrate today. So I want to congratulate you 
and the Leap Africa team, past and present, um, for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, for 20 years, uh, Leap Africa has been inspiring, empowering, and developing young leaders through initiatives and programs like the Social Innovators Program. Through the Social Innovators Program, Leap Africa has enabled young social innovators in Nigeria to scale their ideas and impact by providing them with the necessary skills and tools needed for personal, organizational, and community transformation. Union Bank's uh, partnership with Leap Africa on, on this program began about nine years ago. At that time, we were inching towards our own 100th anniversary and really sort of thinking about um, what we want to stand for. And we connected with this vision of supporting and helping, instilling young people with the principles um, of Leap, uh, of the Leap, with the Leap principles so that they're able to build uh, sustainable uh, enterprises. Through this uh, partnership, we've been able to demonstrate our commitment to empowering and enabling success for young Nigerians and for Nigerians as a whole. If you look at the, at the banners behind, you can see that this year we're celebrating our 105th anniversary, so we've been here for a while. Um, Union Bank's partnership with Leap Africa and the Social Innovators Program um, sorry, we are proud to have supported over 150 SIP fellows. I know that uh, today we said 200 fellows, but we've supported about 150 of that since we started. And as was said earlier, obviously the, the, the impact is, is a multiple um, of that. And we're especially proud that even post the, the SIP programs every year that we've been able to sustain relationships with some of the fellows and working with them on a lot of our community initiatives when we can. People like Mama Money, who have trained 7,000 women, Vic Fold, who's working on waste um, uh, recycling management in Quara, and Rudef out in Sapele. We continue to work and engage with the SIP fellows even after the program to ensure that we're supporting them in their endeavors. Um, this partnership has also provided our employees uh, with an opportunity to contribute and to connect and to be mentors and facilitators and supporters on an individual basis with, with, um, with the SIP fellows. So we're very grateful for that as we as an organization try to encourage our employees to be part of the community and to support. And this program has been um, helpful in helping us um, provide opportunities for our, our employees. Um, to the SIP Fellows of 2022, congratulations. Um, you, are all, you all past and present fellows are hope for the future of this great country. Um, and we are um, rooting for your success as you push your ideas forward. Thank you for your creativity, for your passion, and for the resilience that it takes to drive any kind of endeavor um, in our country. Uh, to all our guests today and on behalf of Union Bank, thank you very much for your support and we look forward to a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we one more time celebrate Ogochuku Ekezie from Union Bank? You know, she started her welcome address by thanking and celebrating the founder of Leap Africa, which is fantastic. But again, we will want to thank you for your support over the years, because imagine that you were not supporting us. We probably won't be celebrating 20 years today. So the thanks goes to you, Union Bank. Thank you very much for the incredible work that you're doing, translating into transforming lives across Africa. And if you can't even imagine, beyond Africa. So thank you, Union Bank. Thank you again. Can we celebrate Union Bank, please? Thank you. I promised that it was going to be an amazing day, entertainment, conversations, networking. And right about now, we will have our first performance for the day. Let's make welcome, with a warm round of applause, a drama group all the way from Nigeria. Let's make welcome EFest.
don't come on, signal me. If the girls don't come on. Africa. This is Africa, my home. Africa, my continent and my pride. From the color of my skin to the texture of my hair. From my strength and virility to the breath of my smile. I am African. From the stride of my gait to the span of my arms. From my strength and masculinity and to the glow of my skin, I am African. When I forget who I am, I remind myself by finding my stride and I remember that I am an African. I am strong, I am free, and I am loved. With each stride we take, we gain endurance. And that is a form of bravery which has made this happen again today. But beyond bravura performances, Leap Africa has massively and selflessly shaped bold solutions with aura of concerned development across Africa's space, especially in this unprecedented time. It is exactly two decades of inspiring, empowering, and equipping young African leaders who had strong hope for building an Africa for a better tomorrow. So today, as part of our unmatched commitment for affirmation of basic human values, we stand to reawaken, redesign, and re-emerge Africa beyond potential. Oh, Africa, my continent!
Africa, beautiful Africa, this is the pride of my continent and I am proud to be African. to be African, or if you are even proud to be in Africa, a round of applause for E-Fest. Thank you. It was just because I left my dancing shoes at home. I was going to dance upstage, but I quickly sent someone to get my dancing shoes, but that was very beautiful. Can we celebrate them one more time? Africa is rich, rich in culture, rich in people, rich in potentials. And Leap Africa already saw that, so they tapped into that 20 years ago, and they are developing the potentials that we have. Congratulations again to Leap Africa. You know, I'm thinking back 20 years ago. Where was I 20 years ago? Or what was I doing on my 20th birthday? 20 years I was done with university, I, w I had served. I mean, it's such a long time. Not a lot of organizations or foundations survive, maybe two years, but 20 whole years. That's two decades. One more time, let's celebrate Leap Africa. Thank you. Thank you. You know, they say that social innovation is one of the most critical ways to bring humanity back on track. So today we're getting on our first conversation and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Can we have the video introduction, please? Our keynote speaker is Henry Kessner. He is the managing principal, Sovereign's Capital. We have a video introduction for him, and that will be played very shortly. But meanwhile, if We have tea at the back. We have drinks. We have juice. Please make sure you are not hungry because we've catered for all of that. We will take care of you. So entertainment, refreshment, and of course, insightful conversations. Again, we will wait for the official introduction of our keynote speaker, very distinguished gentleman who has graced our conference today. I'll read his profile. And for me, it's such an honor that I get to do this one-on-one. -on -one. Henry Kessner is a managing principal at Sovereign's Capital LLC and a contributor and podcaster at faithdrivenentrepreneur.org and faithdriveninvestor.org. Sovereign's Capital comprises a family of funds across venture and private equity in the United States and South Africa, Asia. Sovereign's Capital invests in leaders whose faith and values create a workplace culture that is also about business excellence and community citizenship. Henry Kessner is also the co-founder and former chief executive officer and chairman of the board at Bandwidth and co-founder of Republic Wireless. Combined, the two companies have the company's values and faith, family, work and fitness in that order. Henry's past professional life included positions at Arthur Anderson, Merrill Lynch, and several boutique institutional firms focused on energy trading based in New York City. Henry and his wife live in Los Gatos, California, with their three teenage sons. Ladies and gentlemen, very distinguished guests, please with a standing ovation, Join me in welcoming our keynote speaker at CEPA 2022, the Legacy Edition, our distinguished keynote speaker, 
Henry Kaysner. I thought the applause will be louder. Thank you. Celebrate our keynote speaker. We are delighted to have you, Henry. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great honor. Uh, I had no idea what the video was going to be. I didn't know if it was me growing up with some family movies or if I was excited about it. Maybe we can see that later. Um, what an honor and a blessing for me to be with you all here. I want to thank my great friend and Diddy for her friendship and her partnership in the broader faith driven entrepreneur movement. and being a great inspiration and encouragement to me as she has taught me her love for Africa and has helped me to develop my own growing love for Africa. I must say that I felt a little envious because the last speaker and dancer came up and said, clap if you're African. And I wanted to clap because I feel that God has put Africa on my heart and yet I felt that maybe I'd lose some integrity with you all if I did. But uh, I have traveled to more than 50 countries talking about faith driven entrepreneurship and business in my career. And I have never had a better welcome than Nigeria. I've never been more encouraged by the dynamism in the marketplace or more excited about the potential of a nation than Nigeria. And that's uh, just incredibly encouraging for me because this is my life's work. And when you come alongside people and you meet people like Ndidi and Claire and Femi and the team, it just is an incredible jolt. It's so much better than coffee. I just am so grateful. So I want to talk to you about something that is likely on your hearts, which is scaling an organization. What does it look like to scale, to grow an organization? You're involved in entrepreneurship and you want to grow. Well, what's the secret to that growth? It's money, right? Capital, financial capital. But is it? I'm 52 years old now, and I've spent a life as an entrepreneur, and I've gotten a chance to learn a lot of lessons along the way. Maybe the biggest lesson is endeavoring to understand the difference between being faithful and willful. So much of my entrepreneurial career has been characterized by being willful rather than faithful. Probably none more so than in the field of looking to raise money. So if you want to get a presentation on how to effectively raise capital, one could possibly say that I'm the wrong speaker. And yet I think that the lessons that God has taught me about raising capital and growing an organization will apply to you. And yes, I do believe that if you apply these lessons and if you learn from the mistakes that I've made, you will stand in a better chance to be able to raise the capital, the financial capital, that will help propel your growth. There's a passage in the New Testament that really resonates with me a lot, and it, I won't go into all the details of it, and I'm paraphrasing here a bit, but it talks about somebody wanting to find happiness and trying to find comfort in all the different things, in clothes and shelter and provision. And Matthew 6.33 says, Aim first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. There's an eye trick that is kind of an optical illusion that I remember as a kid growing up, and what would happen is if you kind of trained your eyes and you looked beyond the image right in front of you, then the image right in front of you would come clear. And I've always been fascinated by that dynamic. And I think that it really applies for raising financial capital. Okay, what do I mean by that? I think that there's something else that we need to aim our eyes toward, and all the other things that will provide success in our enterprise to include financial capital will come as well if we keep the right focus. So what does that look like? Well, I want to couch that secret to scaling, if you will, into some lessons that I've learned along the way from a good friend of mine named Kirk Kyle Hacker, who's the chairman of the board of an entrepreneurial accelerator in America called Praxis. And he says that you as an entrepreneur have three jobs, just three jobs. One is to steward the mission and vision of your organization. Two is to resource it. But three, and this is the big one, three is get the right people on the bus. So how do you do that? How do you get the right people on the bus? 
Well, you get the right people on the bus by doing some things and avoiding doing some things. The first one, in order to be able to get the right people on the bus, is to be able to articulate your why and invite people into something that is bigger than you and bigger than them. We all want to be a part of something that is much bigger than the manufacture and distribution of widgets. There is a great TED.com talk, and I think about TED because I've been Diddy's talks there. Great TED talk by a guy named Simon Sinek that talks about the power of why in articulating the why. He does it through the lens of Steve Jobs and the Wright brothers. If you haven't seen that, please look at it. It's just incredibly powerful. And it talks about the connection or the lack of connection between the limbic section of our brains and the verbal section of our brains. When we can talk to somebody about why we do what we do that resonates with them because it's about something bigger than themselves, bigger than you, it resonates with them at the soul level. When you understand that we have an opportunity and invitation from God, regardless of your faith foundation, when you look at, when you look at creation all around us, the majesty of a God that worked six out of seven days draws us in. When we understand our call to create and the invitation that we have to make the world a better place and we can articulate why we do what we do, that will be winsome to all of our stakeholders, none more so than those people that we want to have on the bus. Those are the people that share this bigger purpose with us. There are employees, there are volunteers, and yes, eventually they will be our funders. But how do we get the right people on the bus? I want to go ahead, I want to go through that one more time because I love simple frameworks. If you're an entrepreneur, the three things for you to do, steward the mission and vision of the company, the enterprise, two, resource it, and three, get the right people on the bus. So one of the things I think is really important about getting the right people on the bus is what it connotes. It means you need the right people on your team because you can't do it all on your own. Notice those are the three things for you to do, not the other 97 things that you're doing right now. That was a lesson I learned at Bandwidth in the early days. You see, when we're starting Bandwidth, which through the grace of God has become a really successful telecommunications company and spawned out Republic Wireless and Relay Go in addition to Bandwidth, at the beginning, I was trying to do it all myself, along with my business partner, David. You know, if you're a parent, if you're a parent with young children, you know, understand the concept of letting them go and running when they're like two years old. And you're so worried because if they fall, they're going to skin their knee, right? But when you're an entrepreneur and you hand an assignment to, an, to a, one of your fellow employees, they're not skinning their knee when they fail. They're skinning your knee. And that really hurts. That took me a long time to really understand how I needed to persevere through that discomfort and enable and empower the people that we got on the bus. When I had to do everything under my own power, again, I tended to be willful rather than faithful. When I did that all, people would show up to work, ask me what to do, I'd tell them, they'd do it. But it wasn't until I realized that we're hitting this glass ceiling when I was trying to do it all by myself and not just focusing on those three things, and allowing other people to make those mistakes that all of a sudden they had ownership. Because we want them to have ownership in the why, in the mission, in the vision and have it to be their own. That's how your employees, your team members, those you bring on the bus will be thinking about the problems that you're trying to solve in the shower on the way into work. When that happened, as we started allowing our lieutenants to start making some mistakes. They got empowered. They did make some mistakes, but then they owned it because they owned the mission and the vision. Well, how does that happen? Well, part of your role, back to number one, stewarding the mission and vision, is to talk about what is the mission and vision, to talk about our why. I think of it a lot like um, a, uh, maybe even a military analogy. You're the, you're the leader of a battalion, and you need to be able to articulate where you are going and what it will be like when you obtain the objective. So think of yourselves as going ahead and taking that hill, okay? That hill is what the world looks like when you have accomplished your mission or vision or you have had success along the way to solving the societal problem that you see. 
Your job as a leader is to articulate that vision in such a way that they can feel it, that they can taste it. And then what you do is you deputize those in your staff and say, listen, you're responsible for providing the provisions for us to get up there. You're responsible for providing security, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody understands the role that they play and you give them enough latitude. Once you've articulated what it looks like, tastes like, feels like to achieve it, and then it is theirs. That's remarkably important. So I want to give you another framework to think about how to go ahead and equip the people on the bus so that you have an operational excellence and a diverse body of people who own the mission and vision so that the funders that come into your organization will see a degree of scale and success and people bought in and when that happens you'll find all the resources you need to grow so what's another framework that that I like to use well I like to think that business and even for those of you running a social enterprise there is a business aspect to what we're doing the business is as simple as this. It's about acquiring customers and retaining them. One of the things that's missed on a lot of business school students, social entrepreneurs, etc., is the fact that it's five times more cost effective. Out of, this is out of MIT. Five times more cost effective to keep a customer on board that was otherwise going to leave than going to buy a new one. An incredibly important concept. Lots of reasons for that. One of the things that happens is that when we have a loyal base of customers that we have endeavored to delight and to serve as a part of our mission, when we have them, they tend to be our stickiest customer, our biggest cheerleader, and as a result, the great source of referrals, and as those of us as we know with business, the best referrals are not only those that come in um, and stay along, but they are also free, right? Because they come in from somebody else. Uh, for businesses, um, it's just, just, it's just an incredibly important concept. Okay, so how do you go ahead and how do you do acquiring a customer well and retaining them well? Well, the thing that makes business even simpler than those two things is the importance of being able to rain, retain our employees. How do we get the people, collect the people around us in a way that they want to help us to achieve our mission? How does that happen? Well, some of it I already addressed, right? It's being able to articulate the why and be able to paint the picture of what it looks like when we've achieved success. You see, when we end up losing our employees, we lose not only the ability to bring on customers well because of the employees that we train to be good at acquiring customers or to serve them, but we've lost the collective mojo, if you will, the collective creative spirit to go out there and solve problems for our customers. And so how do we keep those people, what does it look like for us to keep those people on the bus? Well, I think that it's this focus on being able to love our neighbor and those around us. And so one thing I want to give to you is, and then I'm going to just close out here in a second, is that one of the things I've missed in the early days is I went ahead and had so much of a focus on trying to go ahead and, and raise money. And just to give a little clarity on that, in the early days of our enterprise, David and I thought that we had some success to reinforce, so we went out there and tried to raise money. And we thought that raising capital would be the solution for all of our problems. So over the course of two years, we went 0 for 40 in venture capital raises. Incredibly long, hard slog. When I look back on it, and think about what it would have looked like instead to have spent that time honing our business model and inviting people into our mission that could help us to achieve it. And thinking about personal development, working with our customers and our partners. We were being willful on thinking that money was the only thing that stood in the way of us being able to achieve success. We had a fund called Sovereign's Capital. Sovereign's Capital was meant to invest in faith-driven entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia and in America, and it took us two and a half years to raise $12 million. We were so focused on fundraising that we didn't focus on the operational excellence. It was only when we focused on our mission and our craft and inviting other people to come in to help solve the problem we were trying to solve, which is giving access to capital for young faith-driven entrepreneurs in developing markets. It's only when we actually focused on the execution that the money came in. The money came in 
only when we had a broader group of people who were so bought in that those who wanted to invest money in us would spend time with others in, on our team or those we sought to serve and saw the mission and the passion and the fruits of our labor and then they felt equipped to come in. You see, what we are doing, what we are trying to accomplish is so much bigger than ourselves. Everybody wants to be invited into something that is bigger than themselves. As we focus on scale and not just on the finances, we focus on articulating our why, understanding that we're a part of the bigger picture of what God is doing in the world. As we invite our employees, our partners, our vendors, our customers into that process. As we invite people, particularly if you're running a social enterprise, as we invite volunteers in on that process, we broaden the impact of what we do, we broaden the network of those that, that come into contact with what we have, and the money will follow. Aim first for how God is using you to fix what's going on in the world. Aim second for bringing the right people on your team. And you will find that if you do those things, the capital will follow. Incredible honor to be with you all here today for me to be able to share a little bit about some of the mistakes I've made. Again, for too long, I thought capital was the sole thing that, that I needed in order to scale. And I missed the ability to invite a larger section of people in. And it was only when I knocked my head against the wall enough thinking that it's got to be raising money, but instead focused on doing those three things that Kurt talked about, which is starting the mission vision, resourcing, and bringing the right people on the bus that the capital came. So I hope that's something practical for you to be able to bring back to your social enterprises. Please know again how much of an encouragement all of you are to me. We are all together getting out there, leaning into opportunities, solving injustices, addressing poverty, making this world a better place. I would so desperately want to see you all succeed for the benefit of the, the incredible country of Nigeria, for the impact that that will make on Africa, and the inspiration and encouragement that will be for entrepreneurs around the world. Please do focus on bringing those folks onto your team that buy into that mission as you articulate what it looks like, tastes like, feels like to achieve that goal. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Very deserving of another standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't telling a lie or just being extra. When I told you today was different, it was special. We, had ve we have very distinguished speakers in the house. This is the first. We're looking forward to the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another round of applause for our amazing keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Henry, for your kind and gracious words about Nigeria and Africa. Thank you again for sharing from your wealth of knowledge and experience. And thank you for the very deep and valuable insights that you shared. Again, one more time. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you and we are delighted to have you here. As we move on today at the 2022 SIPA, I would like to recognize a few persons in our midst. First, I would recognize the founder, Leap Africa, co-founder and director at Sahel Capital. Please, a round of applause for Mrs. Ndidi Okonkwo. Ungunelli MFR, the brain behind what you see today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the applause. Next, I'll recognize Mr. Udeme Ufot, MFR, Managing Director, SO and U, and our board chair at Leap Africa. Thank you for the incredible work that you do, sharing the bird of this amazing organization. Next, I would like to recognize Ms. Rabi Isma, non-executive director, Stambik IBCC, PLC, and former director, leadership and organization development, Nai Mobile Nigeria. A round of applause, please. Thank you.
I'd also like to recognize Femi Taiwo, Executive Director at Leap Africa. A round of applause for Femi Taiwo. Thank you. We have Mrs. Uche Pedro joining us, founder Bella Naija. Thank you for joining us. Mrs. Clara Omasheye, Managing Director, JNC International Nigeria Limited. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Mr. Simon Kolawale, founder, CEO, Cable Newspaper Limited. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Chike Madwebuna, CEO, Afri Noli Limited. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We have Amal Hassan, CEO, Outsource Global. Thank you for joining us. A round of applause for him. Thank you. We also have Ade Shola Shotonde Peters. Former VP Finance at Unilever, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Let's keep the applause coming. Let's not get tired. Thank you. We have Michelle Ntiru, Business Advisor, Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies, Stanford Seed. Thank you for joining us as well. We have David Lanre, President of LEAP, Af he's president LAAN and he's also a LEAP Africa alumni. Can we please applaud him? Thank you. Tola Adeyemi, a partner from KPMG joining us. A round of applause for Tola Adeyemi. Thank you. Waziri Adi, former executive secretary at Meiti. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Sadiq Usman, Head of Strategy at Flour Mills of Nigeria. Thank you for joining us as well. Larry E. Eta, Executive Chairman and, beg your pardon, Executive Chairman of Barracuda Capital Partners Limited. Thank you for joining us. Joe Abba, Country Director, DAI. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let's not get tired of the applause again. We have Abasiyama Idaresit, CEO Wild Fusion. Thank you for joining us. Pell Uzokwe, Head Sahara Group Foundation. Remember, we spoke about Union Bank and Sahara Group Foundation. So we have Pell from Sahara Group Foundation. She is the head. Thank you for your support again of Leap Africa. Thank you for joining us. We have Kole Shatima, Director, MacArthur Foundation, Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. We have in our midst Frank Nweke Jr., Co Chair, Fix Politics. A round of applause. Thank you for making our time to be here with us, sir. We have Honorable Sheyi Adisa, Honorable Member representing Afijo State Constituency or your State House of Assembly. Thank you for joining us. And just to correct the recognition I made earlier, Dr. Oke Enelama is founder African Capital Alliance. Thank you for joining us. I apologize for the mix-up. Thank you for making our time to be here with us. On this Thursday, every one of you could be doing other things, but you're here to join on this very critical conversation. We thank you for joining us. This year, are you applauding yourselves? Please feel free. Thank you. This year, we have an interesting lineup of speakers, like I said earlier. And they'll be sharing invaluable insights around our theme, Reawaken, Redesign, and Reemerge, Africa Beyond Potential. We have three TED-style lightning talks that will be delivered by our three amazing speakers. And we'll be hearing from two of them virtually, and one will be speaking to us in person. We ask that you please sit back and enjoy all these TED Talks. First on the list, we have Efosa or Jomo. Can we have his video, please? A round of applause whilst we receive his video. Thank you. Efosa or Jomo was selected as one of 30 thinkers in the 2020 Thinkers 50 Radar list the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking, and sharing the leading management ideas of our age. He researches and writes about how innovation can transform organizations and create inclusive prosperity for many. In January 2019, 
alongside the late Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen. He published the book, The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Can Lift Nations Out of Poverty. Christensen was the world's foremost thinker on disruptive innovation and was a mentor to Efosa Ojomo. Efosa leads the Global Prosperity Research Group at the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, an innovation-focused think tank based in Boston and Silicon Valley. Over the past several years, his work has been published and covered by the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, The Guardian, Quartz, Forbes, Fortune, The World Bank, NPR, and several other media outlets. He speaks and consults often on how organizations can develop a culture that fosters market creating innovations and has presented his work at TED, the Aspen Ideas Festival, the World Bank, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and several other conferences and institutions. His TED Talk on innovation and corruption has garnered over 2 million views. In a Wall Street Journal review of the prosperity paradox, Rupert Dowell writes that the book provides a better way to fight poverty as it returns the entrepreneur and innovation to the center stage of economic development and prosperity. A Foster graduated from Vanderbilt University with a degree in computer engineering and received his MBA from Harvard Business School. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Efosa Ojomo. Hi everyone, um, I hope you're doing well. Um, my name is Efosa Ojomo. I am a director of Global Prosperity at the Clayton Christensen Institute. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, uh, but I hope some of the ideas that I share will help you in the work that you do in um, building great organizations and ultimately helping uh, Nigeria and Africa uh, become prosperous places. I often like to start every talk um, by uh, just doing a gut check um, and asking a question, uh, a question that grounds everyone. And the question is, right, annually, how much does the Nigerian government uh, have to spend per person, per citizen? If you take the federal government budget divided by how many people we think uh, live in Nigeria, uh, or really wherever I'm doing this talk, um, how much do they have? Uh, I often get guesses, uh, and very few people actually get the right answer. If you guessed $200, you would be correct. But $200, what does that really mean? Uh, well, when you begin to compare that with other countries and what their governments have to spend per person, you start to see where we are. You start to see the importance of the work, I think, that many of you do. Reality starts to set in that even though we uh, do have, if, if somehow tomorrow we had everyone in government doing what they're supposed to do, uh, we had institutions that worked, as impossible as that is, with just $200 per person per year. But even if, even if by some miracle we had that, you'll begin to see we have a significant uphill climb. Development is expensive. Democracy is expensive. Prosperity is not easy. And now that I've uh, grounded us in this uh, uh, you know, conversation and sort of giving you a sense for where we are, um, the question for us should become, how do we increase this number? How do we increase this $200 number so it becomes 2000 20000 40000 I don't know how we do it without the work that all of you do. I don't know how we do it without the work of innovation. I don't know how we do it without the work of entrepreneurs. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I'll start by talking about what the prosperity paradox is. Then I will explain the importance of good theories, what a theory is, 
And we'll end with the power of market creating innovations. Because I don't have a lot of time, let's go ahead and dive in. Many of the ideas I share with you today, I ascribe to my late professor, Clay Christensen. Uh, he was a professor at Harvard Business School, and he was the architect of disruptive innovation. And he had this thing he often said, in any organization, uh, when they're struggling to make progress, it's because they don't have a common way to frame the problem. If you step back and think about the problem of poverty, the problem of development, the problem of prosperity, uh, even the problem of innovation, you'll find that so many people think the problem is one thing, the solution is something else, and there is no consistency on how we are approaching uh, these issues. And so my hope is that some of the language I introduced today will help ground us and help us get a better sense for how to approach these problems. Now, I first got into the development world in 2008, when I read about a 10-year-old Ethiopian girl who had to wake up every morning at 3 a.m., fetch firewood, walk miles into the city in a cell. Now, I remember feeling so distraught uh, because there were hundreds of millions of other girls across the world who that was the life that they lived. And so I decided to do something about it. I went home to Nigeria I went into a poor community, a village, and uh, this is one of the images I saw. Women by the side of this uh, stream of water washing clothes. Instantly, I said, I know the answer to this problem. Build a well. That's what does it. And that's what I did. Went back to the United States where I lived. I raised some money, got friends together, and we built a well. Well, if you've ever built a well or been part of a project like this, you know many uh, wells don't last, or they're not designed to last forever. About six months after we built the well, it broke. Um, I did all I could to get somebody to go into the community to fix it, but after building several wells and after they all broke, we, uh, the organization said, this is not working. Whatever strategy we've employed, right, is not working, where we try to fix the problem by providing a resource that we think is the solution. It turns out that there's a mechanism missing, a mechanism missing, and we will talk about what that mechanism is. But before we go too far, that issue of looking at communities as poor, lacking, and deficient, and then providing whatever resource or solution we think is the answer is prevalent across the world. Prevalent across the world. When we go into a poor country and there's no water, no education, no infrastructure, what do we do? Let's build wells, let's build schools, let's build roads, airports, bridges, ports, the healthcare, let's build hospitals. How many of these resources are we building and how many of them are actually lasting? How many of them would we be proud and happy to participate in, right? How many? Not very many, not very many. That is because there is a core mechanism missing that makes these things sustainable, makes them work, makes them context specific. And that is why understanding theories is so important. Understanding theories is so important. When I walked into that community, I had a theory. My theory was, if I build this well, the community will have water. That's a theory. It was a faulty theory, but that's a theory. And so what is a theory, and what theories are you using to solve any of the challenges that you are encountering? Well, a theory is nothing more than a statement of causality. What causes what and why? Theories tend to be circumstance-specific, characterized by if-then statements, and sound theories, when they're really good, they can help us predict the future. Now, after my organization built five wells, we had developed a theory. <laughs> and our theory was, if we build a sixth well, 
then that well is going to break after several months. <laughs> because every other well we had built, for the most part, had broken. And so understanding the theories that we're using to make decisions, because we all are, whether we know it or not, is incredibly important. And this is where innovation plays a critical, critical role. But what is innovation? Now, if I asked everybody here what innovation was, I'm sure you would all get it right, but you would also say different things. And so let us ground ourselves in a definition of innovation that we could all agree on, and then characterize innovation into three major components. Innovation is the change in the process by which an organization transforms inputs of lower value into outputs of higher value. It's a change in the process by which organizations transform inputs of lower value into outputs of higher value. So uh, in the simplest of terms, if you go to a restaurant and they transform inputs of lower value, different spices and uh, different ingredients, and they give you a plate of jalof, that is innovation. If you go to a uh, manufacturing plant and they take a bunch of different components and they put a car together in a certain way, that is innovation. And so the question that comes up after we understand what innovation is, is who in society has access to the outputs of higher value? Who has access? Because whether we talk about schools or hospitals or uh, housing, access to housing, every organization is engaged in one way or another in innovation. And so when we ask that question, who has access, uh, we get to something really interesting. We find that there are primarily three types of innovation. The first are what we call sustaining innovations. Now, these innovations are designed to improve performance. They target people who can already consume products and services. They tend to expand existing wealth networks. Um, so when you get a new uh, phone and you get a new camera on your phone, more memory, you get a nice new car uh, and you get heated seats or things like that, those are sustaining innovations. These innovations are targeted at people who can already consume of which there are not many in Nigeria and Africa. The next type of innovations are efficiency innovations. These innovations enable us to do more with less, but what's unique about them is they are still targeted at existing consumers, people who can already consume. These innovations actually can, they don't always, but they can exacerbate inequality. They eliminate jobs. And so when uh, your company says, we're going to move our manufacturing plant from this region to another region, we're going to leverage some kind of automation to help us do things more efficiently so we, know we don't hire a couple more people. That's an efficiency innovation. In fact, dare I say, Nigeria is designed to prioritize efficiency innovations. Resource extraction industries are anchored in efficiency innovations because the average manager in those industries are simply looking to cut costs on how much it would take to drill a barrel of oil, how much it would take to transport that oil to the port, how much it would take to mine some gold, uh, some diamond. That's efficiency innovations. Now, the last uh, type of innovation are called market-creating innovations. And this is really where the secret source of prosperity comes from. These are innovations that transform complicated and expensive products into products that are simple and affordable. So many, many, many more people in society can get access to them. Now to build a market creating innovation, you have to look at people who currently are not able to consume existing products on the market whether it's because the products are too on the market are too expensive, they're too time consuming, they require a certain level of skill in order to use them. And so the people who can't consume them don't have those skills. So therefore they don't consume. 
whatever it is, market creating innovations target what we call non-consumers. These innovations create jobs because when you target people who historically could never afford uh, or access a product, you need many more people to make the product, market the product, sell the product, uh, service the product, and then so on. This type of innovation is at the core. It is the bedrock of development. This type of innovation is what is sorely lacking across Nigeria and Africa. And if we do not figure out ways to prioritize these types of innovations, I'm afraid development will continue to evade us and we will languish in poverty in perpetuity. A round of applause one more time for that session. Any of us, many of us, we didn't want that session to end. We just, it just ended. I'm like, we wanted it to continue. But that was a very beautiful, beautiful speech. I must say, innovation is to ch change your process and organization goes through to transfer inputs of lower value to outputs of higher value. And it took us through different types of innovations. And most importantly about you know, social innovation is not just seeing a problem and just solving it. You need to understand the problem, frame the problem to require the right innovations that you would use. A round of applause one more time for EFOSA. Thank you. So earlier on, we recognized all our board members, you know, um, but most specifically want to recognize our board members in the room that are here and present with us. So I will recognize them again, if you don't mind, just applaud and recognize our founder in the, in the room. One more time, Mr. Demel Ufot in the room. One more time, please welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Ms. Rabi Usma, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mrs. Claire Omaseye, thank you very much for joining us. Managing Director, welcome, welcome, welcome. And most specifically, we also want to recognize one of our partners. You know, Leap Africa is a combination of different people, different resources, friends, families, colleagues, past and present, working together to transform African raising leaders. And also want to recognize um, Frank Weke Jr., the third in the room. Just, okay, he stepped out. Okay, when it comes to recognize me, get a round of applause for him one more time. Thank you very much. Like we said, we have a lot of a lot in store for us from entertainment, from interesting and insightful conversations, and also a networking um, opportunity to meet the people in the room. Once again, a round of applause for joining us, and let's welcome our online audience who are also here with us. Now, we'd like to have spoken word, just to break in the conversations before we continue. I would like to welcome a spoken word artist. She's a writer, award-winning spoken word artist, fine fashion designer, and model who is a member of the Hilltop Creative Arts Foundation and Enactus ABU Zaria. She emerged as the overall spoken poetry contest winner at both the Abuja Literacy Society Grand Slam and the Association of Nigerian Author Slam. Ladies and gentlemen, to take us on spoken word, please welcome Afsat Abdullahi, also known as Afi. Come on around to applause as she comes. I grew up on the streets, and here on the streets we have dreams and aspirations, making innovations and devil's workshops. Here hunger is the drive, and we only thrive to survive here on the streets. Education is key, but what good a key where there are no doors for the poor? We dream dreams because dreams are free, but reality has a fee. You need teachers, you need books, you need to cook ideas that are off the hook. You need an unbreakable mindset that screams, I can. You need a plan and discipline, tough enough to withstand the wind that comes to the desire to win on the streets. You need uniforms, you need to fit in to be seen, you need thick skin, tough enough to block even bullets or the poignant scorn from your neighbor's green each time you dare to try to fly without wings again and again till you break down with realization. 
that no amount of motivation can ever equal education. For what good a fertile ground where there are no seeds to sow? And what good a seed if it never grows? I grew up on the streets. And believe me, these streets will give your million dreams a million ways to die. And no matter how hard you try to redeem these dreams, these dreams would only bloom to shrink under the looms of the dooms of these streets. See, dreams do not survive on these streets. Talents do not thrive on these streets. Yet I grew up on these streets. I did. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> honored to be your miss. I actually use that to get your attention. <laughs> okay, the title of my spoken word proper is This Society. I planned something else on SDGs, but I decided to do this one because of certain activities that happened two weeks ago. My team and I won the national competition for innovators here last two weeks. Um, <laughs> it started in 2016. I don't want to go in detail, but we started in 2016 because that's, okay, detail because that's not the reason I came. I came for spoken word poetry, but I'll give reasons why I picked this particular piece. Um, 2016, we called the project SMS, Shine My Shoe, and then the project grew to Pop Plastic Upcycle Polish. We've devised an innovative way to make polish with plastic. And our team won. And I think we're representing Nigeria in Puerto Rico in two weeks. Yes. Thank you so much. So the, some of the challenges we faced while we're working on this project were some were societal, some were I think the major ones were societal challenges because, okay, our school was on strike, but then we still, I think we volunteered over 10,000 hours for this project. And the typical Nigerian mindset is you don't keep doing things that will not bring you money. So we got lots of challenges. There were financial challenges. There were people that were not um, physically strong enough for this project, but somehow everything came into place last week and it was a moment for me and that is why I want to do this spoken word piece. Okay, it's self-explanatory, so here it goes. This society gives my body a cause for debate, makes my body a walking reminder of my place in this society, so this society has turned my body into a house of limitations into a house where all my dreams and aspirations are reduced to age, to class, black, woman, religion, cripple, sickle, too fat, too thin, too poor, too dream, too irrelevant to be seen, and not even enough thick skin could prepare me for this. This is how society reduces you, reduces me, breaks you into bits of indecision. But right here on this crossroad of decision, follow your intuition. Do not despair, do not fear to do what is right, do not lose sight of the bigger picture. For these dreams you're not, you're not of today, but that of the future. So teach your legs to walk out from conversation that threatens your conviction. Teach your hands to pull out from societal limitation that dares of futuristic inclination. Teach your mouth to speak up, speak out, rebuke doubt, rebuke reasons why your dreams could go south. Teach your eyes to stay fixated on the goal. Teach your mind to focus as you go. See, dreams needs no permission from neither race, religion, height, nor size to decide its medium of coming true. So when next society gives your body a cause for the baby, teach your body to give it back. Thank you. Come on, one more time, a round of applause for Afi. That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For one minute, I thought I had that talent, so I'll just come and do. <laughs> SIP is the future for the. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so, so much. And I love the projects you talked about Shine My Shoe, you know, using plastic to make polish. Quite interesting. Everybody tell your neighbors, Shine My Shoe. 
And that's a call, that was a call for social innovation there. One more time, a round of applause for Afi. That was amazing, that was amazing, that was amazing. Our ladies and gentlemen, we want to move further on this amazing conference. Have you been having a good time so far? Talk to me now. Have you been having a good time so far? So please talk about this on social media using the hashtag LeapSipa2022. You know, share what you're learning. You know, this program is not just to celebrate our um, current and outgoing fellows. It's also to spark young people to also do more. So we believe that when they see your conversations online, they'll be inspired to also do more in solving problems. Ladies and gentlemen, to, talk, to take us further in this amazing conference, we're going to have a next, our next speed talk to by the amazing Vanessa Garrison, C CEO and co-founder of Girl Trek. I'll allow the media team to cue in the video introduction. Vanessa Garrison is the co-founder of Girl Trek, the largest public health non-profit for African American women and girls in the United States. With more than one million neighborhood workers, Girl Trek encourages women to use walking as a practical first step to inspire healthy living, families, and communities. Prior to co-founding Girl Trek, Garrison worked within the criminal justice space, helping formerly incarcerated women access critical services. She began her career working in digital media with Turner Broadcasting System Incorporated in Atlanta, where she managed digital media projects for some of the world's most recognizable news and entertainment brands, including CNN, TNT, and Sports Illustrated. As the co-founder of Girl Trek, Vanessa is among the top 1% of social innovators in the world to receive fellowships from Echo in Green and the Aspen Institute. She has been featured by CNN, NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and named Health Hero by Essence Magazine. In 2018, she was appointed to the national board of the Rails to Trails Conservancy, and her TED talk, When Black Women Walk, has more than 1 million views. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming, with a rousing applause, the delectable Vanessa Garrison. I am Vanessa, <laughs> the daughter of Annette, who was the daughter of Olympia, who was the daughter of Melvina, who was the daughter of Katie. And I call the names of my ancestors into this room because they would be so happy that I stepped off the plane in Nigeria at two in the morning to bring greetings from the daughters of the diaspora. And I offer that daughters of tradition to every woman in this room so that every room you walk into, every board room, every big room that's gonna hear your ideas that you too can invite the women from your maternal lineage into those rooms because we are their wildest dreams. And I want to thank um, specifically Ndidi and Femi for having me here to talk about the work that I do, which is the work of mobilizing black women around the globe to solve the most intractable problems. And I started this work over 10 years ago with my dear friend Morgan. And we did not have a calling around public health and we do not have medical backgrounds. But we were two black women who were looking around us at a health crisis that is killing black women in America at higher and faster rates than any other group. We die from chronic disease and illness, from preventable chronic diseases and illnesses at higher and faster rates than any other group with a life expectancy of almost 10 years less than our white sisters. And we thought, that's unjust, and it is. And when we started to research the solutions, what we found were 
industries, pharmaceutical industries and medical industries that were telling us that the solution was diet and exercise that was really rooted in capitalism of selling back to us medications that we couldn't afford and machines that we couldn't afford and gym memberships that we didn't need. But none of those things were addressing the root causes of our illness. The root causes that would address that we were stripped of our homelands, denied our language, told that our culture was inferior and that we were put to work as laborers to build a country that then did not build any systems to support us. That heart disease was really heartache that the trauma and the stress that we were experiencing as black women had manifested itself as diseases that now this industry was trying to tell us we needed their expensive medications to solve. But we knew differently. And Morgan and I knew differently because we were students of history. And so we just started to go deeper into our history and our history tells us a little bit something different than what we just heard in the earlier talk about um, Mr. Christensen being the architect of disruptive innovation. God bless Harvard and all of the white men who will tell us that they were the architects of things that our grandmothers and our great great grandmothers and their great 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 grandmothers pioneered. But in fact, if you study the history that we teach to black women around the world of Queen Nanny, of the Maroon people who fought back to protect her island of Jamaica, if you study Queen Nzinga, if you study Wangari Maathai who brought back Kenya from the brink of environmental devastation by teaching women to plant trees, then we understand that in fact black women are the architects of disruptive innovation. And that in fact, we all know a woman right now who's turning 15 cent into a dollar to feed her children. That we know women right now in villages and urban centers who are absolutely creating solutions out of thin air and will never get celebrated for it. For us in the United States, we got deep into that history to teach black women around the world that Harriet Tubman herself walked of the Ashanti kingdom, brought to America, walked almost 90 miles on her first journey to freedom and then went back over and over and over again to bring her people to freedom. That Fannie Lou Hamer, the great civil rights activist with only a second grade education raised on a plantation in Mississippi, single-handedly registered 60,000 voters in the midst of Jim Crow, Mississippi. That's what you call disruptive innovation. And we teach those stories to black women so that they know from whom they come. And we taught those women those stories and we coupled it with one powerful solution, and that solution was walking. Walking has always been a source for change around the world, from Soweto to Flint, Michigan, to what you see on the news every day in America. Walking is a social call to action for people to take to the streets. And so we combine the, the powerful history of walking with the public health facts about walking, which is that it is the single most powerful thing that a person can do for their health. And we started to mobilize first just our friends and family because solutions can be and should be local and deep and personal and proximate. And so in our first year of organizing, we had just the people who we knew in our inbox. We emailed our friends, we emailed our cousins, we emailed our family and we said, will you join us on the front lines? Will you take to the streets and start to walk with us? And about 500 women in 2010 said yes. And 10 years later in November of 2020, we celebrated a million black women walking with us every single day. And those women aren't just walking to reclaim their health, inspire their daughters, and take back the streets of their neighborhood, which they are, but they're walking so that they can be frontline change makers. And Girl Trek teaches those women 
how to organize in their communities. Because we know that as a woman goes, goes her household, goes her neighborhood, goes her community. And we know that when we carve out time with intention for women to walk and talk together, there is absolutely nothing that they cannot solve together. So today that movement which is flourishing in the United States with women walking and we wear bright blue shirts every day when we walk, we call them superhero blue because we say we are the superheroes of our community. And you can find those women right now in any neighborhood in America lacing up their sneakers, some of them at 5.30 in the morning before they go work back-breaking jobs, some of them at 5.30 in the evening after they have worked back-breaking jobs, some of them after church and church parking lots, some of them while waiting for their children to finish school, but all of them determined to let them and let their stories be the catalyst for bigger change. And that change, I'm excited to say, is coming to the continent. And that change is coming to the continent because first, by word of mouth, which some black folks, we know about word of mouth, black folks, African, we could tell our friends, right? All over the world, we've started to see the superhero blue shirts. And they just started to pop up as women started to follow us online and we put all of our tools online open source because a movement requires you to let go a little bit of the control of it so that it can grow. And so we'd look around and we'd see a woman walking in Brazil and we'd see a woman walking in England and we'd see a woman walking in Costa Rica and we'd see women starting to pop up here in the continent and starting to walk. And now with intention, in 2022, we've started to organize across the continent with women walking in Kingali and women walking in South Africa and women walking in Ghana and women walking in Malawi. And I'm hoping that after I leave Nigeria that we will have some women in blue shirts who will be walking. And I offer that tool to the women here, not just as a means of organizing and creating change, which you will be able to do once you start walking and talking, but also because of this. Because Girl Trek believes that self-care is a revolutionary act. Because Girl Trek believes that black women have laid their bodies on the line for movements who have not served them back, and we are want to say no more of that. No more will we, will we organize on behalf of organizations or businesses or movements or ideas that also do not care if we live and thrive. And so we want to remind black women everywhere that you are your greatest cause and that we are worthy of living regardless. And that you, the sisters in this room, especially the ones who got up at 3 a.m. this morning to check on this venue, the ones who are making sure the food gets served in the back, the ones who are going to do the cleanup after, the ones who are going to do the follow-up after, that you also have prioritized yourself in the care of yourself in the caring of others. Because that's what revolution looks like. Revolution does not look like sacrifice and martyrdom in the name of somebody else's causes when we are losing our greatest resources, which is the black women embedded in our communities who can tell the stories, who can pass on the traditions, and who can teach the healing techniques that no pharmaceutical company or medical industry will ever truly be able to grasp because it's in our DNA. And so I share that message with you, and I say thank you for having me here, and I ask every woman in this room to start walking with Girl Trek, to start continuing that grapevine word of mouth sharing and telling your friends that you heard that there's a movement of over a million black women who are changing things every single day, not, not asking for permission to save our own lives, which is what we say in the Girl Trek movement, but every single day lacing up going out after what they want, walking towards their greatest dreams, and walking away from everything that does not serve them. Thank you so much for having me. Please let us celebrate a truly phenomenal woman, an inspirational leader, a dauntless woman. Please celebrate Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. You may please be seated. Thank you. Vanessa, you are truly a phenomenal woman, and you 
are an inspirational one at that. You know, listening to you stirred up so many things in me. And it reminded me of an excerpt from one of my favorite quotes. It says, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. What you have done here in the past couple of minutes is stir up something in each and every one of us, especially as you started your speech. Thank you, Vanessa, for being here today. Can we applaud her one more time? Thank you. Wow, I am inspired already, and we have just gone halfway. If you're inspired, a round of applause for Leap Africa for bringing us here today. And again, for 20 years of transformational change, touching lives, just revolutionary changes across Africa. Thank you. Thank you again, Vanessa. That was truly inspiring. I'd like to quickly recognize someone very special in our midst. We have Anthony Yodewe. He is the Managing Director, Sahara Power Group, and Trustee on the Board of the Sahara Foundation. Can we please give him a round of applause? Thank you. We're recognizing him specially because, again, he's one of our sponsors, and we're delighted to have him here. Now, prior to assuming this role as Sahara Power Group in 2020, he coordinated and managed the strategic operations of the second largest privately owned electricity distribution company in sub-Saharan Africa, Ikeja Electric, as chief executive officer, leading a staff strength of over 3,000 employees and 1.2 million customers. We do not take your support for granted. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Anthony. Can we applaud him one more time? Thank you. Thank you. As we move on today at this phenomenal conference, because for me, I feel like my year has been made already. I have so many notes from all our distinguished speakers, and we're not done yet. We still have another speaker coming up. We, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Sangu Delhi. Can we have his video introduction, please? <laughs> Sangu is the CEO of CarePoint, formerly Africa Health Holdings, a tech-forward healthcare system operating across the continent, focused on building Africa's healthcare future. He is also the founder and chairman of Golden Palm Investments Corporation, GPI, an investment holding company focused on building world-class technology companies in Africa. Sangu co-founded Clean Aqua, a non-profit which worked in underdeveloped communities in Ghana to ensure that water and sanitation, basic human rights, were provided. Clean Aqua operated from 2007 until 2022 and its projects impacted over 200,000 people across 160 communities in Ghana. In 2022, Sangu launched the Sangu Dele Foundation a grant-making non-profit focused on education, mental health, and job creation. Sangu is a trustee of the Pedi School, a board member of Ashesi University, a member of the Harvard Medical School Dean's Global Health and Service Advisory Council, co-chair of the Leadership Council of Harvard Center for African Studies, a board member of Ghana International School, and a member of Harvard University's Joint Committee on Alumni Affairs and Development. He is a member of the Selection Committee of the Rhodes Scholarship for West Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the amazing Sangu Dele. Hello and welcome to the 2022 Social Innovators Program and Awards organized by Leap Africa. My name is Dr. Sangu Dele. I wish I could have been with you in person, but I'm grateful that technology allows us to do these things virtually. First of all, congratulations to all the fellows. This is an exciting milestone, and I'm sure you're all proud of yourselves and what you've all accomplished up to this point. And I know that all of us in this room are looking forward to the greatness that will unfold as you go and you embark on driving your different social innovation projects forward and I can't wait to follow your progress. By way of introduction, I am an investor, I'm an entrepreneur, and an author. 
My focus has been on entrepreneurship and the socio-economic transformation of Africa for the last 15 and a half years. And this is the context that informs all that I'm going to share with you today. So the theme of your conference is redefining the leadership of social innovation. And I thought that for when I think about redefining the leadership of social innovation on our continent, I thought the best way to share my thoughts on this was to focus on entrepreneurs who are driving this, inspired leadership, driving entrepreneurship in a dynamic Africa. So I want to share three case studies with you that will exemplify for you some of this inspired leadership that is doing incredible things in the social innovation space. And I also want to share some, some key takeaways across these three case studies that will demonstrate three things. And the first is, is going to demonstrate for you the disruptive promise of technology, which is a theme you're going to see cut across many of the case studies that I'm going to share with you today. The second is you're going to see that all the entrepreneurs are taking problems and challenges and are turning them into opportunity. So problems into opportunity. And the third you're going to see is that the level of boldness and scale in how they're going about embarking on their solutions is they're no longer thinking small, they're not thinking micro, they're thinking at a large level, systemic change level, macro level, pan-African level. And those are the three key themes that I'm going to keep emphasizing as I go through some of these case studies that will hopefully inspire you. The first, I'm going to start, they say charity begins at home, so I'm going to start with my own experience as a social entrepreneur. And I want to tell you about the company which I co-founded and which I run as CEO called CarePoint. At CarePoint, our big vision is we're building Africa's healthcare future. Why? Because anyone who's been to a hospital anywhere across the continent knows the challenges we face with our healthcare, both from a quality perspective, from a shortage of doctors, from problems with getting supply of medication, from a lack of coordination, from fragmentation. There's so many issues. We are 15% of global population. Yet we are responsible for 26% of global disease burden. And we only have 3% of global healthcare workers. I mean, the, the math simply does not add up. And this is with us at 1.3 billion people. Forecasted to get to 2.5 billion people by 2050. When one in four people globally will be African. And when 70% of the world's youth will be here in Africa. So I always say that the future will be African. Okay, the future will be African because if the youth are the future, where are they going to be? They're going to be in Africa. So what are we doing at CarePoint? At CarePoint, we're taking, we realize this challenge, both with quality, with the shortage of doctors, all these different things I mentioned, and we realize that there's an opportunity for us to leverage technology, to be able to make a difference. There's an opportunity for us to take a patient-centered approach and an opportunity for us to take a scaled network approach so we can leverage economies of scale and scope. On the technology front, we pioneered an, an, an amazing innovation where we said we don't have enough doctors to send all over the place. And if we do our traditional telemedicine as it's done in the West, the cost of data is high. It would make it inaccessible. And so we had to think outside the box and we came up with this idea where we started putting these tech-enabled micro clinics, which are these small clinics where you walk in, you go to the doctor's office, and the doctor's office is actually a screen, just like this, and you have a virtual consultation with a doctor. We can send a lab tech on a motorbike to you wherever you are, and we can deliver drugs wherever you are. So this was an innovation that was adapted to the realities, the idiosyncratic realities of our health system here on the continent. And you see in this example, we leverage the disruptive promise of technology. We took a problem, a big challenge. We put our mind to it, thought outside the box, 
and we said, how can we turn this challenge into an opportunity? And by doing so, we've been able to build one of the largest healthcare systems, tech-enabled healthcare systems across the continent. We now have 65 hospitals and clinics serving 1 million patients in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Egypt. The second case study I want to share with you is one of my portfolio companies um, from Golden Palm Investments, which I co-founded 15 and a half years ago, Andela. Many of you probably have heard of Andela, and Andela is a company I'm always excited about to talk and discuss because Andela, its mission, right, the ethos of Andela, which is the idea that brilliance is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And so Andela, at its founding, saw an issue where they, they looked at Nigeria and saw that we have a problem with high unemployment. And we know we have a lot of brilliant young people. The problem is not the brilliance. The problem is the opportunity. At the same time, they recognize that there is a shortage of talent when it comes to engineers and developers in the West. Yet we have all these masses of young people across the continent who are thirsting for opportunity, who are brilliant and who can add value, but simply don't have the means to do so. So Andela came in to plug the gap. And they created an opportunity to train and develop a whole ecosystem of software engineers and developers across the continent. And those guys, they were able to match with tech companies in the West. And we've seen the, the magic that's been created from this. Not only has it resulted in, in building out a massive um, and a robust pipeline of engineers and developers, not only has it helped create, you know, high, um, you know, very high value employment for our young people, it has also created a situation where you now have Andela alumni going out to, to found companies like Eden and others. And so you're starting to have an ecosystem of ex Andela folks who are now the founders or co-founders of startups across the continent. So it's helping to contribute also to our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And of course, Andela is now valued over $1 billion. It was last valued at about one point, I think one and a half billion dollars um, in the round that was led by SoftBank. And, and so it's an exciting win-win for us as a continent, for investors, for employees, and for all the stakeholders. And again here, you see something where you have a problem of unemployment on our continent. You have a shortage of talent when it comes to developers in the West. And you've had this innovative model that comes in to say, how can we solve both problems in a way that's going to add value and become a win-win for everybody, leveraging the disruptive promise of technology. And Andela has done this at scale, operating in multiple African markets, um, starting in Nigeria and moving to others, including Egypt and Ghana and Kenya and, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so Andela is another example that I hope will inspire you as you go about embarking on your own innovative journey. The third and final case study I want to share with you is Jetstream. So Jetstream was founded by Mishe Adi, who's a brilliant, she's a brilliant entrepreneur. And she built it because she realized that African businesses were struggling with managing their supply chains. And so Jetstream has built its own proprietary technology where it uses its technology, its network and its systems to enable African businesses finance, manage and monitor their regional supply chains. Right. And Jetstream has now raised millions of dollars and they, they are now powering this across the continent. But the reason why I particularly bring Jetstream is that not only is it also an example of uh, leveraging the disruptive promise of technology and of course taking a problem and turning it into a solution. But I mentioned Jetstream because unlike the prior two startups, CarePoint and Andela, Jetstream has a woman as CEO, Mishi. And I mention this because as we, we need to pay attention to the gender issue, and that's an issue where we saw $5 billion in record venture capital dollars flow into Africa last year. 
less than 1% went to women. So I want to put this at the forefront of your minds. Women are one of our greatest assets on the continent. We have the highest rate of female entrepreneurship in the world, with more women starting businesses in Africa than anywhere else in the world. And it's something that we need to harness and we need to use to our advantage. So we need to make sure that instead of exacerbating these gender inequalities, we look at it as an asset because it is. A study from McKinsey has showed that if we actually bridge the gap on gender inequality globally, it will add $12 trillion to the global economy. So I hope these examples, these three case studies have shown, will leave you with some inspiration as you go about building your own businesses and your own social enterprises. And I want you to remember, one, your model should solve problems and add value, as these examples have shown. Two, you need to leverage technology or you will be disrupted. And three, you need to be bold and be Pan-African and scale. We have major big problems facing our continent. We need major big solutions. We cannot come up with micro solutions and tiny little solutions for the sorts of problems and challenges that we have. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of inspiration from scripture, uh, a quote which is one of my favorites and that has inspired me since this is a room of young innovators. And that is 1 Timothy 4.12. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So go forth and set an example with your social innovation projects. Congratulations to all the winners of awards later today and make us proud. I look forward to following your journey and I know that the greatest of all of you is yet to come. Thank you, God bless you. Wow, what an incredible session we've had so far. And thank you Sangu for sharing your experiences with us. You are an awesome entrepreneur yourself, so we appreciate that you're here. Thank you for sharing valuable nuggets with us. Thank you for reiterating the importance of thinking solution, and not just solutions, but big solutions that will solve the challenges that we have in Africa. And of course, again, technology is an enabler and a driver, so we must embrace technology for disruptive innovations. Again, we must be bold and audacious. I think all our speakers have been bold and audacious today. Can we celebrate all our speakers so far today? We still have many more speakers coming up, but we will receive them shortly. I think it's important to emphasize that the Social Innovators Program is in its ninth year, and it's important again for us to pause at this time on the occasion of our special legacy edition to appreciate all our sponsors for their unwavering support. We'll begin with our pioneer sponsor, Union Bank of Nigeria. On this special occasion, thank you, thank you. On this special occasion of the legacy edition of the Social Innovators Program and Awards, the Leap Africa have a gift for you. Please, let's focus on the screen. Hello Union Bank team, a big thank you for supporting the SIP program over the last decade. I mean, you guys are a dream partner as it were, uh, because you didn't just bring resources, financial resources, it was obvious that you were fully sold out on the vision and you give of yourself and your time. Hi, my name is Ogoli Alero Sandra and I am the founder of Rural Development and Reformation Foundation. Becoming a lead fellow in 2017 made a significant difference in my journey as a social entrepreneur. Thank you so much Union Bank for the support over the years on the Social Innovators Program. We truly appreciate working and trusting this vision of upscaling and equipping young innovators in Nigeria and on the continent and helping them build sustainable enterprises. Coming on board as facilitators, as mentors, remarkable stories from the SIP fellows, 
uh, who have been mentored by Union Bank staff. I remember Mr. Joe, the, the then CFO, who was a major supporter. Ongo, who has been a faculty for maybe more than six classes or six years. Um, becoming one of the outstanding fellows in my set gave me the opportunity to receive a one million naira grant from Union Bank. And this was the first step towards scaling our work after which we got support from Union Bank financially consecutively for the next three years, which gave us an opportunity to scale massively and give us visibility on a global scale. How do you define a corporate organization in Nigeria that supports a non-profit the way Union Bank has supported the over 10 years? From inception, when we had the first class of 2013, 2014, you have sponsored, you have supported the cause. One of the biggest things they've done as they've rebranded is their CSR. They've invested so much resources into uplifting Nigerians and Nigeria through that initiative. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being very innovative, being very creative with your support. And I speak particularly about the way you even found ways to further support the SIP fellows, making them vendors, making them partners in your work. I'm so grateful to Union Bank for their support and their uh, continuous belief and trust in our vision. To Union Bank, to Leap Africa and its partners and board members, thank you so much. We are because of your support. I would truly like to say thank you on this occasion of our 20th anniversary celebration. Thank you for advancing the sustainable development goals in no small way at all, helping to build very sustainable, strategic, social vehicles that are adding value around the world. We appreciate you, we thank you, and we look forward to doing more with you. Thank you so much, Union Bank, for not just being big, strong, but for being reliable. Thank you so much. Thank you to the entire team and management of Union Bank of Nigeria for trusting and believing in us at Leap Africa, even in the difficult times. We truly appreciate your invaluable and your incessant support and contributions to lives across Nigeria and Africa and beyond. One more time, let's celebrate Union Bank. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In 2020, we had another organization sponsoring a course within the Social Innovators Program under what was called the Social Impact, beg your pardon, also what was called the Sahara Impact Fund. I'm sure by now you know who the sponsor is. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's recognize our other sponsor, Sahara Group. Come on, put your hands together for them. Sara Group introduced the first cohort of the innovators in the 2020-2021 class, and the Leap Africa team also has a special gift for them. Please, let's turn your attention to the screen. Hey, hello, Sara family. Um, just want to say a big thank you for supporting the SIP programs. Thank you so much, Sahara Group. We would like to appreciate you on this occasion of our 20th year celebration. We have worked with you over the past year and we are now having the second cohort sponsored by the Sahara Impact Fund. We are very grateful for the years we've enjoyed working together and we are looking forward to many more years where we are able to do so much more. And it's been a truly incredible experience working with you and your team and having your team support social innovators across Africa. Thank you so much for working with us. We appreciate the partnership and we're looking forward to many, many more uh, partnerships with the Sahara Group on other programming that Leap Africa continues to deliver to young people. We are very grateful for the partnership, the support. They made our fellowship more robust, more exciting. We are excited to have partnered with you. Thank you for what you're doing for young social innovators. It's been exciting, the entire journey, and we are grateful. And we thank you again for believing in us, and we hope to do much more in the coming years. Sorry. Uh, once again, um, co founder and CEO of Benside Technology. Um, we really want to say a very big thank you to Leap Africa uh, for the support within the last five months. They've brought a lot of support to us, they've been very engaged, 
in the selection process, they've been very engaged. We appreciate you, I'm looking forward to doing more. Uh, I'm looking forward to just doing more with you. Thank you so much. We want to say very good thank you. And um, I wish um, Deep Africa an amazing and awesome anniversary. And uh, thank you for always uh, doing your best to help thousands of um, young entrepreneurs and uh, social entrepreneurs and business persons like us. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please a big, 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 big round of applause. I'm waiting. A round of applause for Sahara Group and Union Bank. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. We're looking forward to more partnership and more support over the coming years. Thank you so, so much. It's important to note that one of Leap Africa's long-standing partners, Ford Foundation, has constantly supported the Social Innovators Program and Awards in diverse ways over nine years of its growth and expansion. Please, I'd like us to recognize our big, big, big um, partner and, and support, Ford Foundation. Please, a round of applause. Thank you very much to so Ford Foundation for all the support. Cut to our sponsors. The Social Innovators Program is now in 10 countries across Africa. Come on. Is that a big one? 10 countries across Africa, and we're looking forward to expanding even beyond those 10 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, can you join us in appreciating them one more time with a special applause? Thank you. I don't think we should get tired of celebrating our sponsors because without them, without them, without our sponsors, Sahara Group and, of course, Union Bank, thank you so much. Thank you. We will now be moving to our star-studded panel conversation today. But just before then, we would like to remind you that if you have any insights you'd like to share with your friends and family, your connections on social media, please remember to tag us at Leap Africa, at Leap Africa on Instagram and on Twitter. Again, use the hashtag LeapSipa2022. LeapSipa2022, that is the hashtag to use to keep the conversations going. Let the world know what is happening right here at Eco Hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. We want these conversations to reach the ends of the earth. I mean, that is the interesting part of social media, right? So we want you to change the world from your seats, from your mobile devices. Tweet at us at Leap Africa and use the hashtag LeapSipaAfrica. Today, our panelists will be sharing their stories through the lens of the contextual struggles African entrepreneurs face while highlighting their respective business enterprise transformations. The stage will be set up very quickly for our panelists because we would first invite our guest moderator who will be on stage to receive other members of the panel conversation. Thank you. So the theme of this panel conversation is social innovation and sustainability, navigating difficult contexts. Young innovators on the continent are pushing boundaries and limits in reaching for sustainable development of their different enterprises. In the wake of a global lockdown and lingering pandemic, Talented innovators were stretched to unprecedented levels. Many enterprises folded up and couldn't even survive the shocks of the pandemic. Others folded up long before the pandemic as founders struggled with accessing the right skills, information, and communities that could strengthen their capacity to seize expansion. So we'll be listening very shortly to what I call, again, a star-studded panel, panel conversation. And I'll introduce our moderator very quickly. Once the stage is fully set, she'll come up stage to receive other members of this plenary session. Thank you very much. Again, we thank you for spending your Thursday morning with us. You could be doing several other things, but you're here to be a part of this amazing conversation. Thank you. Our guest moderator is a global professional with over 20 years of experience in international development, social responsibility, technology innovation, business advisory, and finance in Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the United States primarily. She's currently the senior advisor at Convergence Finance, leading blended finance activity across Africa. Please let's make welcome, with a warm round of applause, Micheline Ntiru. 
a warm round of applause. I know I said warm, but we can make it resounding. Thank you. A resounding and a warm round of applause. Thank you, Michelle. We're delighted to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Micheline. So you would receive other members of your conversation. Thank you. So we're looking forward to this discussion. And without wasting time, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Please, when, you, when I call them, please join me and welcome them with a resounding applause. Our first panelist on this discussion is Damilola Aseleye. Damilola is an experienced renewable energy expert, currently comp completing his, her PhD thesis in energy engineering. She's a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM ambassador, and has inspired several young people to choose the STEM pathway through mentoring, tutoring, and presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Damilola. Thank you. Our second panelist is Akofa Dawson from Ghana. Akofa is a short fiction writer who regards writing as a means of creating and curating today's story for prosperity. She also manages a creative social enterprise that assists emerging creative expressions, whether to end of a career pathway for social impact or therapeutic endeavor. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, with a round of applause, Akofa Dawson. Also joining this panel conversation, we have Isaac Damian. Isaac Damian Ezirim is a technology inclusiveness advocate and a social development professional with over eight years of experience in community development and technology advocacy. He completed a one-year leading change program at the Institute of Continuing Education, University of Cambridge, UK. Please, let's make welcome. He's already seated. Isaac Damian, thank you very much for joining this conversation. Finally, but definitely not the least, we have Saeed Juma. Saeed Juma is a dentist, entrepreneur, and founder of the Smile Shop Limited, a network of dental clinics which started in 2012, providing access to affordable yet quality dental health care, a firm advocate for community development and social entrepreneurship through this company he started the 100,000 Smiles Project in 2014 with the purpose of improving access to dental health care in underserved rural communities in northern Nigeria. Please let's make welcome Saeed to join this star-studded panel conversation. Thank you. Over to you now, Micheline. Just testing my mic. Can you hear me? Wow, what a special occasion. And indeed, what a star-studded set of young professionals who are solving Africa's most thorniest problems. You know, when I was asked, you know, even a few weeks ago to talk to another set of SIP innovators, I admitted something that I'd like to admit to you all, to you all which is, I mean, I wish I was a youth. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, a little bit over, a little bit over the mark, quite a bit. But I really wish I were a youth. And I don't know as a young person if I were risky enough, gritty enough, uh, ambitious enough, resilient enough to start something from scratch and persevere and bring people to come along with me. So thank you so much. I am in awe, okay? I always feel like an imposter among entrepreneurs. So what I do is I just chat with them, hang out with them, advise them, and where possible in, invest uh, in you. So they've given us the task of um, digging through the surface and keeping it real. How do you navigate these challenges, right? The title is something fancier than that, but that's the gist of it. How are these amazing entrepreneurs, social innovators, navigating the challenges? Because it isn't easy. You see them having won awards. You see them looking so shiny and bright. Nice shoes, nice hats, nice earrings. But the mind is filled with a thousand problems to be solved this month, okay? Having solved a thousand 
last month. So, we're going to get straight to it. I have a bunch of questions for you. It's just a conversation. Yeah? Um, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not going to pick on anyone, but I would love actually us to, to make sure that the amazing audience knows how great you are. Can you just tell us one thing quickly, and I will cut you off, because if you're too long-winded, I'll, I'll just cut you off and get on to the next thing. But one thing that you would like us to know about you that was not said in your entrepreneurial journey, one thing, okay? Then I'll get to the meat of it. It's a nice warm start. Anyone? Should I pass my mic? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, one short thing is I, I never wanted to become a dentist. <laughs> so I'll keep it short. Maybe we'll talk more about that during the motivation part. Okay, so one thing about me is that I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was 13 years old. So that wasn't stated. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, um, so when we started um, Teens Can Code, I never really wanted to start an organization. I just wanted to do something good. And my involvement with Leap Africa really exposed us to a lot of knowledge that helped us to, you know, um, structure the then initiative into what we're doing today, which is now Teens Can Code. So one thing I want you to know about me is starting my social enterprise was from a personal resolve. I was trying to solve um, a personal problem and I realized that there are other creatives who are also facing the same issue. Thank you. Wow, okay, all right. So I'm going to definitely take off, perhaps, yeah, I think I'll take off from where Dr. Smiles. First of all, isn't that an amazing thing to be called, Dr. Smile? So, I mean, I, I'm tentatively showing my teeth up here, okay? <laughs> this is a person who, for example, in Northern Kano, you know, in, in the North in Kano, you know, had a drive giving dental care, um, I, I believe face masks, and other, you know, uh, dentistry care to, is it over 100,000 individuals? You, please just, I mean, that is just amazing. Feel free to give him a round of applause for that. I, right? So I would like you to share with us, in, in, in all of that, right, what was your true north? Did you wake up and say, I'm going to hit 100,000 and then my work is done? Or what was and perhaps continues to be your compass? Well, thank you so much um, for that question. And I want to use this opportunity to thank um, our host, the organizers, Sleep Africa, for inviting me here. I also want to thank um, Henry for the amazing session you, know, you gave. You know, human resource is one of our major challenges as social entrepreneurs, finding the right people to key into what you're doing. Because sometimes you think you're just being crazy. Why do you just want to go to the villages and check everybody's teeth? But I, I took a lot from what you said. So thank you so much, um, Henry. Um, my through north, you know, I said I, I never wanted to be a dentist, but I don't tell my story without saying how it all started. You know, um, having lost my mom at a young age, as I was 10 then, um, to uh, um, chronic um, disease, um, I saw how she suffered and threw it all until she passed on. And then I knew my life's work was to not to let anybody else go through pains or suffering that could otherwise have been preventable. And then I made up my mind to become a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, but, you know, my dad got influenced by his brother, um, and they decided that I should study dentistry because, after all, there are a lot of doctors in Nigeria, but not too many dentists. Um, and I got admission into school. So this was about 20 years ago. And I told my uncle, oh, uncle, I just got admission to study dentistry. And he said, well, that's great. You know, when you graduate, you will have the opportunity to travel out of the country because there are more job opportunities there for people like you. You know, our people in, in the north, I was speaking in Hausa, and Ariwa, they don't really care about their oral health. That struck a chord in me, and I think that was, that, that made going through dental school worth it, and that became my life's work to ensure that more people 
in Africa, especially northern Nigeria, had someone who would talk to them about their dental health and, you know, help them not go through pains or suffering that they otherwise would. My motivation only got, gets bigger every day because there's a massive brain drain going on in Nigeria right now. I could be in any country right now, like most of my colleagues, working and earning a lot of money, but I think I was built for, for today. And a lot of our social innovators, don't forget, that dream that you have, it's for the future. And um, this brain dream will only make healthcare more expensive, especially dental healthcare. And now I see the reason why, you know, that, that passion was stirred up in me and why I started the 100,000 Smiles Project. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing us a bit of your personal journey. I want to pick on uh, Dami Lola because, you know, when we think about climate change, still on the continent, we have naysayers. Uh, when we think about energy efficiency, still we have, you know, people who understand, maybe they saw a solar panel somewhere, they don't understand, you know, the impact that these energy efficiency measures, you know, are having and will continue to have on sustainability. I have a question. First of all, congratulations for being in such a, I think, a very underrepresented field, especially when it comes to African women. Um, and my question is, what are you working on <laughs> right now? <laughs> Because sometimes it seems like a vague, nebulous field. So grab a concrete example of what you're doing and just give us a sentence or, or five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Micheline. So what am I working on right now? <laughs> I'm working on a lot of things. <laughs> so to be specific, right now I'm working on ensuring that we have more women in the energy sector and I'm also working on ensuring that energy access gets to the last mile communities. There are so many communities out there that they don't have access to electricity at all. Like about one billion people globally do not have access to electricity. And out of these in Nigeria, we have over 93 million. So imagine that we in maybe Lagos or urban areas, we are still complaining about having few minutes, few hours of access to electricity. What about those that are in the very, very rural communities that do not have even one second of electricity because the national grid is not close to them? So they tend to have more expensive electricity and more dangerous electricity because even if you want to sell diesel to them or kerosene or petrol, it's more expensive because the cost of transporting this to them is more expensive. So they buy it at higher cost. And these alternatives also add to climate change, global warming, health issues, so we need to take electricity to these last mile communities. So I and my team, that's what we are focusing on right now. So we go to communities that, when you go to these communities, you'll be wondering that, damn Lola, what are you doing? <laughs> so communities that we have to go by boat rides over one and a half hours on the sea to these communities. And they also need electricity because electricity is the bloodline of economic development. So they need to be developed. They are also people, they need that access to energy. So we do that, but then we also ensure that there is gender inclusion in what we do. So I've realized that what we become, it's um, the foundation is laid when we're very young. So a lot of, um, when we go out, we rarely see women in the energy sector or even in technology sector. If you're in the engineering sector, maybe with two women out of 100. So we ensure that we take different programs to young girls to see that women are doing it, women are capable to climb roof if they want to, to be an energy engineer if they want to. So we mentor them, we motivate them, 
right from a young age to ensure that we have that gender inclusion in the sector. So these are some of the things I'm focused on right now. And I can see wonderful, right? And I can see she's only given us but a smudge of, of, of what you're doing. Aquaba, you know, as we know, this SIP is a Pan-African initiative. We might be in the big, bad Nigeria, but we welcome our sister here from Ghana. I would love to hear from you, Akofa. I would love to hear about, um, I know that you, you have, uh, is it Nadeli? And also Ink Up. Yes. Now, what is the biggest challenge that you are tackling? Again, to keep it tight, let's say this quarter. And of course, you can weave in some of the creative things you're doing with, with those entities. Right, so the problem is big, the unemployment and underemployment of Africa's youth. And we thought, what can we do to contribute to the resolution of this problem? And as creatives ourselves, the founding team, we realized that creativity is an untapped potential of the African youth. So when there are opportunities, usually they are skewed to um, the hardcore entrepreneurship, agriculture, but really not so much attention is paid to creatives. So that's where we come in. We are giving emerging Ghanaian creatives options for employability and entrepreneurship with their creativity. So we all know that passion doesn't pay the bills and mostly if you're a creative is because you're passionate about what you're doing. So what we're doing is we're giving them the structure to be able to turn their passion into creative professions. Yeah, so essentially that's what we do at Nadeli. It is truly fantastic because I know that there's more than a, but there are more than um, a bunch of creative entrepreneurs here. And so you know who to target, you know, in terms of how do you structure that creativity to create something that essentially is tackling, again, one of our most pressing problems, and she's looking at unemployment as, as one. Okay, so now to Isaac. I was just wondering, did you actually meet the queen? <laughs> did you meet the queen? We have many queens, by the way, on the continent, but then people refer to the one queen at Buckingham Palace. I just want to know, when you got that award, and congratulations. Thank you. Did you actually meet the Queen? Yes, I did. Okay, um, all right. So yeah, I've had, I've had people ask me this question, I mean, several times, if you really did meet um, the Queen. Uh, myself too, on the day of the award, I was also doubting myself, like, is this really happening, you know? In fact, as, at a point, I even had to say it out. I didn't even know that the person sitting beside me heard me. I was like, is this really happening that I'm meeting? Side voice came out. Yes, and then the person was like, yeah, it's, right, it's really happening. Mm -hmm. And I turned to look at the person, I'm like, oh, I was just thinking, in my, I thought I, I was just thinking, but she heard that. Yeah, it happened, and I also owe that, and also thank the work that Leap Africa is doing, because Leap Africa Social Innovators Program was that platform that really positioned us for global impact. You know, when I joined Leap Africa, like I said earlier, I wasn't really thinking about starting an organization. It was just my birthday coming, and I had just won a hackathon as a tech person. And then so I said I was going to just train a couple of guys around in my church who always ask me, oh, we like what you're doing. So I just thought my birthday at that time was going to be an opportunity to do that. I was going to register them in a center to do and pay for them. But later on, I thought, let me just gather up to like 10 of them and train them. And then when we started, it was the feedback that I got from them and some of my tech friends who volunteered with us. It was the feedback that really motivated us to continue the work, which also got us the award from the Queen. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Okay, um, you know, wonderful uh, that somehow by just accident, you are now leading a lot of efforts. I would love to ask you about uh, you know, some of the, the teen products that you're developing, I was reading that you combine both analytics as well as kind of creative approaches. Just give us, you know, a sentence or two about essentially what is that biggest, what is the bigger picture behind that? Why do we need these analytics? Okay, um, first off, as an organization, when we started, we were just involved in coding, teaching kids how to code, but 
Um, after years, we introduce other initiatives, we inc which includes the hackathon. So we ha organize hackathons for young people where they come, brainstorm on problems in their schools, in their communities, and then we see how we can use technology to solve the problem. So right now, the big thing for us is setting up Innovation Center, which we already have one in Alimosha right now. We have an innovation hub where young people come together to learn and create solutions. Um, we're also, um, in a few weeks, we're opening up another center in the same area. So this is important because for us, we're trying to cultivate a, a network of young people who can solve problems, uh, young innovators, young entrepreneurs who can identify problems in their community and begin to be able to profile solution, solutions using the technology knowledge that we are teaching them. Thank you. You know, I know that we want to ask, uh, my eyes on the clock, we want to ask, we want you to ask uh, the Star Studded panel some questions. Let me, um, let me do one question and one wrap up and then hand over to you. So get your questions ready, make, that, make sure they're succinct. Um, so we have some investors in the room, I'm seeing you. And by the way, Sahara, aren't you proud? Because I think Isaac is, is also a beneficiary. Um, so we have some investors around the room. I would like each of you to give a piece of advice for investors. Because when I wear my investor hat, among peers, sometimes we come off as being arrogant, as if we know exactly what you need, how much you need it, when you need it, etc. Talking about financial investments, there are other ways for people to invest in you. So what is that one piece of advice? We'll just go, we'll just start from there up, right? So what is that one piece of advice from Damilola all the way up here to Isaac for investors? Okay, my advice for investors is that they should um, have more homegrown models, more homegrown models for investments. Um, just, to build on, just to build on what she, what she said, um, my advice for investors is yeah, look to, to healthcare because globally um, healthcare is taking a big, a big hit and the more this continues, the, le the less um, our chances of meeting universal healthcare because there's increasing disparity in access to healthcare. So um, healthcare, the healthcare space is something that a lot of investors should look into doing because technology has given us the opportunity to do so much more um, and Im um, impact so many more people. So I would say investors should look at impact investment because in as much as you get a um, return on your investment, you would also be impacting the lives of people who can track directly how much your investment, the, the substance that your investment contributed to their lives. And yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to add to say that investors should um, lower the expectations. There are lots of growing organizations, young organizations, who may not be able to meet some of the criteria that we see investors say. You, for instance, some funds will tell you certain documents that you, you have to provide, certain things that you have to do, but they should consider um, younger and growing organizations who may not have some of these things. And I know that there's an organization that we got funding from through Leap Africa, also called World Connect. And one of the things that I like about what they do is the fact that they look out for local, um, local organizations who are quite small. Uh, sometimes many of the people that received grants from World Connect are like, World Connect is like their first grants that they are receiving. Like for us, World Connect was that first grant we also got um, that helped our work move forward. So I would say investors should lower the expectation, the criteria that they put on growing organizations. Yeah, thank you. Isn't that incredible advice? So investors, I'm looking at you. I'm just looking generally at the six or so dozen, perhaps, investors in the room. Hope you've taken notes. Okay, cool. So now for some quick fire. You guys are so serious. And again, I started by saying they are resolving our most pressing problems, right? Energy efficiency and climate change, healthcare, challenging creative energies to, to resolve things like unemployment, and of course, the idea of disruptive technology, right? So let's just, oof, it's very serious, and I know we have problems, but just a, a spark of fun. So this is a Pan-African initiative. This is a Pan-African room, if I consider 
um, the Nigerians that I see here, of which were many, you're many, but also some of the other Africans and people on, on um, people virtually. Okay, so you have, these are quick fire, that means the answer is just one word or a couple. You have the opportunity to set up a second, or let's say another establishment in Africa. Do you pick Zambia or Senegal? You have to pick one. Zambia. Zambia as well. And that wouldn't be fair. That, that wouldn't be fair because what's on my mind is Zambia, but our Senegalese brothers will wonder what's wrong with Senegal. But Zambia. Okay. It's, it's tough. Okay, but well, I'll just break it, Senegal. Exactly, help the Senegalese a bit. Okay, now we're on vacation. Let's see, Cape Town or Mount Kilimanjaro, Tanzania? Cape Town. Mount Kilimanjaro. Tanzania, Mount Kilimanjaro. Tanzania. Okay, and finally, and we'll start at the end. Moi moi or plantains in a few when we break. Moi moi or plantain? Moi moi. <laughs> Which pop? <laughs> Definitely plantain. I can eat plantain with anything. <laughs> Same plantain. Plantain. Wonderful. I just thought we'd lighten them up a bit. Again, please give it up for this amazing, this really phenomenal and, and transformational quartet of, of really some of Africa's most ambitious, um, successful and young problem solvers and innovators. Um, let's get your questions. I don't know if there's, um, there's help in the room. I see a hand there. Do we have roving mics? Because I can give up my mic. Um, three, I think we have time for perhaps three, four questions. Thank you. Thank you. One right here. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Jordan Abiola Bolade. I'm a journalist and I work in communication. I just have uh, one question. We're speaking about innovation and I believe that also cuts across sustainability. So um, in what ways can we increase public awareness of our ecological footprint, being that how can we be more sustainable? We hear sustainability and all of these things. Like, how can we be more sustainable even in our personal homes? Um, what are some examples of sustainable living? Thank you. <laughs> You're like, who will answer, who will answer? Just go for it. I want to start, Damilola, since this has some climate written on it. <laughs> So um, I think for sustainability, we need to start with measuring our impact before we implement any impact we want to do, and then during and after. And um, you spoke about even from our personal selves. So even in our personal life, we can measure our sustainability. We can measure what we want to achieve in personal goals and um, see how you can have personal goals and measure how you are growing with your personal goals not just in business not just in your enterprise but even in your personal life so i have like a, a tracking metrics and have kpis to your sustainability thank you wow not forgetting that we have our we don't just work we're not just bots but we have a personal motivation. Maybe one more answer if you have a different take. No? Okay, okay, just agreeing. Fantastic. Um, if the mic could rove, oh, you're there. Fantastic. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. My name is Olami Bossi. I'm a social worker. Um, please, I would like the panel speaker to work more on local community. 
there are some that I, oh, I do direct us or oh, fundraising. Like we have Pad Bank Nigeria. He's on Instagram. I'm one of the members. We talk, oh, we boys talk about menstrual health and hygiene. And most of these things, most of that, we used to gather money by ourselves to do this. And we do the, oh, at Sabukoji Island from the ferry from Semis, risking all our life passing through the canoe to the Sabukoji Island. So we need more fundraising to the local community. Thank you. Congratulations, first of all. And when you say we, the, the burden is not only on four amazing panelists. It's you, congratulations for your work, and everyone else. They're at the community level, right? So perhaps more is what you're saying, and more fundraising for the community level. Any responses? Well, I would say start with what you have. Um, I mean, being in, a, in, a dent, in, the, in the health space, especially dentistry, most funders are not looking at dental health. They're looking at infectious diseases and, and all whatnot. So that was one of the major challenges for me, you know, when I started. And at a point of when I w um, attended the SIP in 2014, I was at a crossroads, really, of whether I should focus on making profits for my startup or sustaining my um, activities in the villages. I mean, the toothpaste companies, I wrote to practically every toothpaste brand you know, and everybody wants to talk to the European office. And the European office doesn't know what's happening in Kanu in Nigeria. So it was, it was difficult. But I think that was what motivated me to start the 100,000 Smiles project. And I mean, we have been doing it. We've been on radio um, for the past 11 years, looking for educative and innovative ways to pass across this message. And right now, we, we don't pay for airtime when we have to do a drama on, on radio. And this is like 13 weeks. Right now, we have toothpaste brands calling us to want to partner with us to support what we are doing. So, and this is just eight years from when I participated in the SIP. So I will encourage you, um, set, set realistic goals and then um, work with what you have. The, the more you do, the more you will find um, support coming in for you. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Incredible. I, Isaac, I'm reading your forehead. You have yes, something to um, add. So I'm just going to say that you should start. Uh, if you have identified these problems, then you can actually do something about it. We all here are working in different communities. For me, I started, like I said, sorry? You've been doing for eight years in the community. Okay, so I thought you were asking us to work in... What I'm trying to say is that I'm one of the members of the Bad Bank. We use our salary for this stuff to happen. If you actually know Sabukoji Island, Sabukoji Island is from CMS Ferry. Normally, from my, uh, from my home, home time, from home, they used to tell us not to pass through water. So, we lead our life through that water. So, we need more fundraising. That's what I'm trying to say. Absolutely loud and clear. And I think that Damilola relates to this because you've gone over water to water-based communities as well, right? So, yeah. So I think it would be wonderful if you, you know, over tea, coffee, moi moi plantains, if you just share, <laughs> yeah, just share some of these really, it's the last of the last, last mi micro mile, isn't it? And not forgetting those communities. Um, there's a question that came, uh, Teresa, I think Edith was her name, thank you via phone. And she asked something that I also was wondering about, right? Because Dele talked about the disruptive power of technology and you know, it's just a wonderful catchphrase. Thank God he had examples to back it up, the Andela efforts. But somebody, Teresa, is asking, so specifically, how can we harness the disruptive power of technology? Give us a, a you know, really tangible example. What is needed right now, lest it become another, you know, sort of has-been? Okay, yeah, so it depends on the sector of the person is working. Um, a typical example is in classrooms. We know how technology, um, technology is um, improving learnings. So for us, there's a program we did in 2017 
we taught kids um, our programs, and then one of the kids noticed that some other classmates fall sick, and then the teachers in the classroom don't even know about it. They are not aware. So the guy built a young boy. He was like 10 at, at the time. He built a device that could alert the teachers in the staff room that there's a child running temperature in the class. And then immediately the teachers get the alert. They can come attend to the person. So technology is enabling every industry. So it depends on the industry the person is talking about. You would always find how you can use technology to solve problems around that industry. Even in farming, we hear about agrotech. In, in finance, we have our fintech um, platforms and all that. So. Uh, whatever industry the person is playing, technology, you can actually use technology to impro improve your program. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I love that framework that forced us to address, well, what is that problem? Do we have the problem down pat? Is it well articulated? Then you start to ask, what's the right technology? Oh, time is up. I could sit here all day. Um, this is my favorite thing to do, is to talk to problem solvers, innovators, you know, uh, our award winners. So please, again, congratulate um, the team here. Congratulate these wonderful pioneers. You'll have time to speak to them as you find them throughout the day. Thank you so much for being here. Damilola, Dr. Smiles. I just love saying Dr. Smiles. <laughs> Thank you, Akufa. Isaac, um, it, it's been wonderful hearing, you know, on the ground. How are we being disruptive, creative? How are we tackling niggling issues of health, climate change, unemployment, and other? And thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you very much. So we'll just take a group photograph of the panelists and the moderator. Just our photographers, please. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, give it up for this amazing star studded panel session we just had. Thank you very much. And a special thank you to the moderator, Michelle, who flew on the, all the way from Kenya for this event. Come on, put it up for her. A round of applause for her. Thank you very much. She's also a board member of Leap Africa. I want to also thank you for the amazing support you've given Leap Africa over the years. Even in your time in Nokia, sponsoring one of our first events that led to us having the Social Innovators Program and Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please one more time, a round of applause for, for our... You know, that clap came from this. Round of applause for our one more time. Thank you. All right, going forward, we're going to watch a very short documentary to just talk about and share the impact of the Social Innovators Program. It's a very short documentary. The longer version is online. We'll just do that quickly, then go into the awards presentation. Media, please. Thank you. Uh, initiative. I couldn't pay my, my rent, you know. I didn't want anybody to know my situation. And then deep inside me, I still do not want to accept any job. I just still want to do this. I told myself, look, if, before I leave this, I must bring it to a certain level of awareness, you know. And I, I was homeless. I, um, I was I used that word. I was like homeless in a way. Up until 2017, one of the former Leap fellow shared the link. A lot of things run through my mind, and one of it was like, if this Leap workshop doesn't make sense to me, I'll come back and and look for a job to do because I need to, to be alive, you know, to talk about the Almagiri children. I applied in 2017, I was not selected. In 2018, I got selected to be part of the Social Innovator Program. It was just at the point where I was almost going to stop the idea. First, a very big thank you to Leap Africa for investing in me 
and because indirectly when they invested in me as a young person they've invested in the over 11,000 plus women that we've been able to empower. It was during the program when we were trained on leveraging technology. And I said, okay, I can actually leverage technology to get people to give me funds to lend to these women. So that was when we built the Mama Money platform, that's mamamoney.org. Before the Leap Africa year, we had issues with systems and structures. And then during the course of the Leap Africa uh, year, or fellowship year, we're able to put structure, you know, through the mentoring program or pro opportunity that we were exposed to. So when I look at Hawa, who only just got a job because she passed through the Abokodas program, she had been waiting to get admission, to get a lot of things, but she couldn't. But now she has a better job. She's earning money because she passed through us. So I look at things like that, or people like that, and I'm like, yes, this is worth it. Even if it's just this one person we're able to touch. We got selected for Unleash Innovation, Innovation Platform uh, Lab in Denmark, which was facilitated by Leap Africa. And then we had also benefited from several other you know, uh, sustainable development uh, programs you know, that has really helped in the, in, in, in the company. We couldn't sustain the programs we did. We lacked financial capacity, you know, so we decided to change the whole model after the SIP. You know, we were able to have a board of advisory, have a board of directors, you know, brought in more people and more professionals, and eventually we got the award. It was a total transition for me. <laughs> but the highest point for me was when one of our distributors, one of our women um, sellers, she told me, I quit my job. This is what I now do full time. And now we have so many women like that. You know, it just validated, validated everything that I, that I was doing at that point in time. In 2020, we um, carried out certain projects at different prisons, particularly in Oko Prison Benin and Kefi Prison in Nasarawa. And we actually got funds from Lib Africa to carry out that project. We were able to provide relief materials to um, over 3,000 inmates and um, officers of the prison. Our goal as an initiative was to create the critical visibility about the plight of these children bring their issue to policy level. And for just the last three years, after being a LEAP fellow, we have been able to achieve that goal, not from to the highest level we can think about. The European Union now have Almajuri as part of its pro programmatic area. This is the first time they have ever done that. It's the number of stomachs that we are fed, the number of children that would have never been to school, that were sent to school, the women that did not have hope, but we gave hope. So the people that were actually giving their lives meaning makes also success. And that he alone gives me a sense of satisfaction. Like, yes, we are indeed making great impact within our community, outside of our community. Being a resident at you know New York for a year, studying in Columbia University, shaking hand with President Obama, you will agree with me that it's some personal achievement, you know. But most importantly, um, putting smile in millions of children, creating a future impact that will affect millions of children in the years to come, would have all been lost if I had not, you know, um, gotten the support I, I got from it. Joke Alade Somi, Center for Legal Support and Inmate Rehabilitation. Akofa Dawson, Nadeli. Amina Mustafa, Chezo Global Enterprises. Wanika Charles, Farm Kiosk. Christy Oni, Natal Pro Limited. Evelyn Ode, Emerald Isle Foundation. Masereka. Agency for Rural and Urban Development. Idris Ola, the Blue Pink Center for Women's Health. Leah Oluwatobi Ajibade, Priceless Virtues International Initiative. Osamede Edmond Obayuwana, the Farmer's Sons TFS Cargo Bicycles. Thierry Nijimbere, Action for Green Planet. Yewande Ben, Preg Africa. Mawaje Muhammad Dima, 
Mawaje Creations, Ogechi Mercy Nwoye, Green Axis, Steve Kelvin Olo, Replast Engineering Nigeria, Titi Layo Falaye, Orange Strategy Limited, Uche Greg Atusui, Anieze International Limited, Uwase Allen, The Happiness, William Elia, Shuleyetu Innovations Limited, Olukokun Tolulope Opayemi, Think Bikes Limited. Round of applause and those. Abdallah Nyabi Preyo, Abdullahi Mustafa, Doorway Company Limited, Abe Edi, Edindia Industry, Albert Mogomaye, Bertek, Ligare Allen, Gary Holdings Limited, Aminu Moses, Delphak Nigeria Limited, Ayilara Oluchi, One Pad Reusable Pad, Balong Boro Kletus, Pona Briquettes, Fadei Deborah, Vector Energy, Francis Mbewe Kukula Sola, Gadi Banda Quapro, Garcia Andrea, African Powdered Eggs, James Madere, The Rainmaker Enterprise, Lamin Sise, Karakunku Farm, Siwelwa Lazarus, Virgin Green Renewable Energy Limited, Ame Mathias, Standalone Solar Water Pump System for Irrigation Farms, Michael Osumuni, Moon Innovations, Olawale Thompson, Planet Savers Global Limited, Oluwa Mayowa Salu, Brickify Limited, Mkoma Martin, Rural Modern Energy, Adeyemi Tunde, The Olivet Global Enterprise. Round of applause for all our Social Innovators Program Awards, um, Social Innovators Program Fellows for 2021, 2022. Most of them are present here in the room. Can you all rise while we acknowledge them and give them a round of applause? Come on, come on, let's give them, give it up, give it up for them. Thank you very much for solving Africa's problems, complex problems with your wonderful innovations. You may be seated. One more time, a round of applause for all our SIP outgoing fellows, 2021, 2022 and the Sarah Impact Fund Fellows. To take us further on this, please let's welcome Catherine Bosari to talk about the Youth Day of Service and for the partnerships. Round of applause for her as she comes up stage, please. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, true to our mission of raising transformative leaders, the Youth Day of Service is leadership in action. The Youth Day of Service is a pan-African youth-led social impact campaign that seeks to promote volunteerism, active citizenship, and also the actualization of the SDGs on the continent. The Youth Day of Service is celebrated annually to commemorate the UN International Youth Day, which occurs from the 12th of August. This year, we engaged about 5,000 volunteers across 34 African countries. I think that deserves a round of applause. And these countries were in Northern, Eastern, Western, Southern, and Central Africa. We were able to deepen our efforts in climate protection, environmental sustainability, and waste management by engaging young persons across Africa on over 600 SDG action projects through the support of our headline sponsor, DAO. At the core of the UDO service is the discovery and recognition of young talents who are actively contributing to the actualizations of the SDG on the continent. Please join me as I welcome the country manager and business manager for East, West, and Central Africa, Adebisi Adeoti, to speak to the partnership with DAO on the Youth Day of Service this year and the launch of the DAO Africa Social Champion Award. Please give a round of applause to our DBC. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations to all the fellowship graduates. I bring you greetings from the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, for those who don't know Dow, Dow is a 125-year-old chemical manufacturing company. And our goal is to be um, the most innovative, customer-centric, inclusive, and material science company you know, globally. And that's, you know, we've been doing, you know, so well. Earlier this year, we, we partnered with uh, Leap Africa, you know, on the Youth Day of Service to, you know, engage the youth and the talent on this continent and sensitize them on, you know, the impacts we should expect, you know, from climate change and how, you know, this can be advanced, you know, before things get out of hand. And we're able to identify, you know, quite a number of youths all across Africa. As Catherine, you know, rightly mentioned, this project went across over 34 uh, countries in Africa, and um, even in Nigeria, it was was represented. And um, that being said, we we thought we could take it a step further, and to this effect, we would like to award uh, Jonah Kirabo as Dow Africa Social Champion Award Fellow for this year. I don't know. Is Jonah here? Okay, all right. Congratulations, Jonah, and uh, you know, we wish all the other graduates um, all the best and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dal Africa, for the incredible work that you are doing. We have met our graduating class. Again, well done to them. It's now time for the moment we have all been waiting for. We'll move very quickly into the presentation of awards. Now, over the years, different awards have been instituted for outstanding fellows and alumni. And this year, we have one new award on, that will be unveiled shortly. We shall now proceed to different categories in no particular order. And we would appreciate some of our guests joining us on stage. I will bring them up very shortly. But before we invite the presenters of the awards, we'll take a moment to pause and thank all our mentors and honor them. Every single mentor, if you are in the room, can you please rise? We would like to celebrate you. Again, because without you, this wouldn't be possible. So we're celebrating all our mentors. Please rise for recognition. Every single mentor in the room. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. We are celebrating you before we start to present the awards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For those who are still sitting, we thank you as well. Very quickly, we're moving to the presentation of awards. And I would like to invite Ogochuku Ekezie from Union Bank. Please let's make welcome Ogochuku Ekezie. She will be helping to present this award. She is the Chief Brand and Marketing Officer from Union Bank, one of our sponsors, of course. Again, to join her, we have Femi Taiwo, a director at LEAP Africa. Please come on stage, Femi Taiwo. You'll be helping to present this award. So this category is the Outstanding Fellows Award. Throughout the fellowship year, a few fellows from the 2021 and 22 class have distinguished themselves in character and recorded remarkable growth with their enterprises. They are the Outstanding Fellows for this fellowship year and will be awarded the sum of, drum rolls, drum rolls, one million Naira each. Please join me in welcoming the first winner. We'll be back after the commercial break. <laughs> All right, our first winner is Akofa Dawson, founder Nadlel from Accra, Ghana. Nadeli, beg your pardon, Nadeli. Akofa Dawson, congratulations. You are receiving the Outstanding Fellows Awards. Congratulations.
Congratulations. Next, our second winner is Idris Ola, founder the Blue Pink Center for Women's Health from Nigeria. Congratulations, Idris. Congratulations. He's representing Idris. All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Round of applause for Femme Taiwa and Ogotoku, please. Thank you. The, we'll move on to the next presentation, and this is the Sheyi Bika State Award. It's a award to recognize one fellow who has demonstrated effective financial management and resource mobilization in their enterprises during the fellowship term. The award is to honor late Mr. Shea Bickerstedt, who exemplified financial integrity and accountability throughout his time. He was an extraordinary mentor and coach to many along his professional journey, nurturing accomplished leaders across industry. He was also um, a board member at Leap Africa. This fellow received one million naira for the initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, and the winner is... Mm -hmm. <laughs> the winner is Evelyn O'Day, the founder of Emerald Owl Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause. All right, and to present this award, please let's welcome Mr. Udeme Ufot to present this award to her. Thank you. The board chair, Leap Africa. Such an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining us. He'll be presenting this award to our winner. Congratulations. So I think this is still, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. As we move on very quickly, we will now present the Innocent Chukuma Award for Youth and Gender Empowerment in Southeastern Nigeria. We're excited to introduce this new award, the Innocent Chukuma Award for Youth and Gender Empowerment in Southern Eastern Nigeria. The award honors a distinguished SIP alumni in southern eastern Nigeria who has excelled and made a significant contribution to the fields of youth and gender empowerment since completing the social innovators program this award is in commemoration and celebration of the life and legacy of innocent Chukuma who served as the director of Ford Foundation's West Africa office from 2013 to 2021 Mr. Innocent led the foundation's work in the region with admirable humility, grace, and exceptional knowledge of civil society and governance challenges and governance challenges, beg your pardon, and opportunities. To present this award, please join me as I make welcome an outstanding leader, the founder of Leap Africa. Thank you very much, and the managing partner of Sahel Consulting. To also to join our founder, please let's make welcome Mr. Udeme Ufot again. Can Kole Shetima please come up to, be, to present this award as well? Dr. Kole Shetima runs the MacArthur Foundation office and was also a good friend of Innocent. So please, uh, Kole Shetima, please come on stage. And some of you might know that MacArthur Foundation and Ford Foundation have supported Leap Africa over the years and most recently through a very generous youth-focused fund that's really changing the way youth are engaged in activism and politics in Nigeria. So please give a round of applause to Dr. Kole Shetima. Do you want to say a word or two about Innocent before we present this? Yeah, I think this is a well-deserved um, recognition a celebration of a very dear friend who, uh, I don't know how many of you know Manguno, but uh, on the shoulders of uh, Lake Chad, 
where he went and served and stayed at uh, Mami Barracks and Mami Waters and all kind of things that he did. He worked tirelessly for human rights, uh, for justice, uh, for police reform. So this is a, really a nice occasion to remember him for all that he has done. And I'm sure for all the work that he will be doing because of all the institutions that he has established and the legacies that he has led. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you, Dr. Koleshe Tima. Thank you very much. And the winner of this award for Innocent Chukuma Award for Youth and Gender Empowerment in Southeastern Nigeria is Amanda Obidike, founder SEMI, Makers of Africa. Congratulations to you, Amanda Obidike. And it's amazing that Innocent's family actually was involved in interviewing and selecting the winner. We're so honored. Congratulations, Thank we have so the photograph. Much. Yes. It's come it's to, okay. Yeah, off the backdrop, so just come to the She's center. Make me cry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a short video. If short video clip from the wife of late Mr. Innocent Chukuma, please media, can you just cue that in? Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Josephine Efa Chukuma and I'm so, so excited to witness today's event as Sleep Africa honors my late husband, Innocent Chukwemeka Chukuma. On behalf of the family, I would like to thank the board of Leap Africa for unanimously agreeing to initiate this award in memory of Innocent. To Amanda Obidike, the young lady who is the first winner of the Innocent Chukuma Social Entrepreneurship Prize for Youth and Gender Empowerment in the Southeastern region, I say congratulations. Anyone who knew Innocent in his lifetime would testify to his passion, extreme passion for youth and gender issues. This award, I believe, will go a long way in promoting the ideals and the beliefs of Innocent. Amanda, as you fly the Innocent Chukuma Social Entrepreneurship uh, flag, I wish you all the best. Please ensure that you get to all the nooks and crannies of the Southeastern region and empower as many young people and girls in the region. God bless you. I keep the flag flying. Ladies and gentlemen, please one more time recognize the legacy of Mr. Innocent Chukuma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, we'll go to the last um, presentation, and this is the Sarah Impact Fund Top Fellows Award. The second quarter of the Sarah Impact Fund and the Governance Unusual Program aims to support social innovators in the generation of solutions which will increase access to clean energy, promote sustainable environments. This is all aimed at accelerating attainment of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals SDG in a manner that results in measurable social impact and inspires a good governance paradigm shift. The next round of presentations will be done by, and when I call the names, please do all to recognize them with a round of applause as we come up stage, the director of Sarah Group Foundation, Mrs. Pell Uzoquip. A round of applause for her, please. The director of programs, Lee Africa, Miss Amabel Owankama, please let's put your hands together as she comes off stage. Let's also welcome our board member and managing director of JNC Limited, Mrs. Claire Omasaye, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And alongside other directors from the Sarah Group Foundation that are present. We'd like to invite the Sarah Impact Fund fellows present to the stage to receive their prizes. They are 10 in number and they'll be receiving checks so we can all call them in two batches of five. So can we all call the... Okay. Thank you so much. So just wanted to call up. We have here one of our directors, Ms. Ajiro Gray, who's the Director of Sustainability and Governance at Sahara Group. We'll also have the MD of Ashurami Energy, Henry Menkiti, who's coming up as well. Thank you very much. 
So when I, if you hear present to the room, fellows, I'll just welcome you upstage. I'm Inu Moses Rex. A round of applause for them as they come on stage. James Madia. Just trying to get the photo props ready. So they want you to be within the backdrop. If you can just come closer to the middle. Thank you very much. They're coming from the other side. All right, thank you. Let's, let's go. <laughs> thank you, Amini. Thank you. And the next fellow is James Madia. A round of applause for Mr. James, please. So just, just go in the middle and they will present it. While that is going on, please let's welcome the third fellow, Michael Osumune, up on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's welcome the next fellow, Ligare Alan Milleru, to come take his certificate. A round of applause for Ligare, please. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can we have Ligare off? Thank you. We can leave, we can pass this. Okay. To the center, please. To the middle, thank you. All right, the next on the list is Siveluva Lazarus. A round of applause for him, please. And these are fellows from all across Africa. The next one is Oluwa Mayowa Salu. Can you please come up? Come off stage for your presentation. Okay. Okay. If you receive your contacts of the people, do feel good. If you receive your contacts of the people, do feel good. Yes, hold on. So when you come, just stay in between. Tell and the director. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause one more time, please. Lua Mayowa, please come off stage. So after the presentation, you all come back just for a quick group photograph. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay in the middle. Thank you. The next is Lamin Sise. Thank you. The next is Ailara Assurance Oluchi. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for her. She comes off stage. Ladies and gentlemen, give us an assuring round of applause for Assurance. Just wait a minute. Thank you. After the view. While that is going on, please welcome Olawali Thompson. Next is Gadi Banda. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Mr. Gandhi. And last but not the least, please welcome Claude Albert for his presentation. Albert, and I also want to welcome all the fellows to so please come back on stage after Claude's um, presentation for a quick photograph session. Can I ask the fellows to come on stage? All the fellows that we just made the presentations for. Look at the camera, smile. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I have a group photograph with all the fellows. I just asked you to come forward a bit so that you know some people also stay behind on the straight line. Okay. All right, on the straight line. Okay, no, no, sir, you can, you can stay with them. Okay, sir. Congratulations to all the Sahara Impact Fund fellows. I think it's also important that we mention that they will be getting a grant from Sahara Foundation. So congratulations, congratulations. And thank you, Sahara Foundation. Thank you very much. Let's applaud them as they exit this. Okay, can we have all 10 fellows step forward for a special photograph? Just the fellows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's applaud them as they now exit the stage. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. It's incredible to, to really, to witness this year after year. And honestly, the excitement never, never ceases. It, it keeps building on itself. It keeps building on itself. So honestly, a massive congratulations to Leap Africa. A 20th year, two decades of doing this, of literally stepping into the ring well before people were doing it. The excitement is there. I'm sure you can feel it. Congratulations. Okay, so I'm going to start properly. Um, we have been speaking a lot today. So honestly, bearing that in mind, I'm not going to keep you all here for much longer. But I think this is just something that we wanted to share because we feel ecstatic about what is happening in the room here today. And starting with a warm welcome for our uh, SIF fellows, for the SIPA fellows, we have SIP fellows who've come in from across Africa. It's fantastic to see that, to see them mingling and speaking with people. This is exactly what we envisioned when we started this. So I thank again our partners Leap Africa for making this happen and for giving us this platform. Um, I thank our Sahara employees, our board members, supporters, stakeholders who have been here for the ride. It's, it's our second year on this journey, and it's one that we're not looking to stop anytime soon. Um, no, we, we really do thank you for that. And so, 
Congratulations to the SIPA fellows and to the SIF fellows. People talk a lot about dreams. They talk a lot about potential when it comes to Africa. You see, the thing that excites me about what's happening today is that we've gone beyond dreams and potential. You see people starting. You see people failing. And you see people starting over again. And that is what this is about. Now, I'm here today because, or representing an organization, because we had three African entrepreneurs, much like yourselves, 26 years ago, take a chance on themselves and start off an organization that thankfully, over the last two decades and a bit, we've come to 26 years now, has basically set up, thank you, an energy company that is operating, we like to describe ourselves as African-owned but operating multinationally. We don't say this to brag, it's just a case of saying this is possible, we will do this ourselves, we will continue to bring others along and do it in a way that is fit for purpose. Sahara in 26 years is now operating out of four continents, 42 countries, and, and are not planning to stop anytime soon. We have over 4,000 employees and have decided to support a program like this. Why? Because like you've heard already, entrepreneurship is very much part of our backbone. It's what we believe in. So conceptualizing this and seeing this today, we are certainly overjoyed. We know and we have seen that great things happen when you have Entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, social innovators like yourselves, look at your community and decide that you're not just going to do well. You're not just going to pursue profit, as it seems, but you're going to look at combining your doing well with doing good. And that is what really is our why. I love what as for us. Uh, our guest speaker today, our keynote speaker, was talking about when he said, what's your why? You know, re-examining your why. And I think for us as an organization, that was very much at the back of our minds when we came up with this. Because we know that the work is plentiful, but SDG 17, which is talking about partnering for the goals, resonates very much with us. That's why we came and partnered with the likes of Leap Africa, who do an amazing job, and the other partners that we've had, because we decided that we are going to work together to get this dream of, of creating sustainable societies to come to life. So I'm just asking all of you fellows, you've been filled today, I've been filled, so I'm sure that you have been. When you go back to your countries, when you go back to your homes, because you're also from the people, fellows from Nigeria, please don't let this dream die out. Keep fueling it. Support each other. You have a fantastic alumni network here today. I think cross-pollination is a word that I love to use when I look at all of you and you're learning from each other. Don't make all the mistakes yourself. Ask questions. Be humble enough to just speak to people about it. Come out of your shells because nobody can do it on themselves. You don't want to be making those mistakes yourselves. Today has been truly inspiring hearing from various individuals across the world who are doing fantastic things and it usually starts with that dream. So I'm just asking you all today, I love the, the topic of the conference when he talks about reimagining, reimagining solutions. This program was conceptualized right at the start of a pandemic when we all had to reimagine uh, so solutions for ourselves here on the continent and beyond. I'm asking you in providing those solutions and coming up with those innovations, don't take a, a a one-size-fits-all approach to it. Just think about things that will ensure that your solutions will work for Africa. Sahara Foundation has its focus areas as SDG 7 and SDG 13 because we've decided we're going to go into areas that we operate out of, which may not be as um, exciting to some, it's still fairly nascent, but we believe the need is urgent. So what are we talking about? It's increasing access to energy. You've heard today that up to 50% are still without access to power. It's talking about sustainable environments. We, one thing that I would say for sure is just because you don't perhaps understand the impact or have the uh, intellectual wherewithal to understand the impacts of things like climate change, doesn't mean that it's not affecting you significantly. We don't need to look too far in our environment to see the impact of droughts, of extreme flooding, of erosion, to know that this is real. So that is why Sarah Foundation has pitched its tent there and is looking at getting innovators and entrepreneurs, like you see with our fellows here today, who are coming up with solutions and innovations that will ensure that we accelerate the, the, the growth that we see in these areas. So, 
I'm, ask, I'm asking again today that you please remain passionate, just as our founders did 26 years ago, about staying on the continent and trying to drive that with your innovations. Don't let your dreams die out. I applaud your willingness to essentially start and look around you and get your hands dirty and put in the work because the work certainly is what this fellowship has been about, ensuring that beyond the seed money, you're basically giving the tools that we believe will help you fortify your businesses, will give you the right tools, will infuse you with a mindset because we strongly believe that a good governance mindset is critical to ensuring that your businesses are sustainable. We've taken the time to do that, so I'm asking that you please don't let that die out. One of the examples that I think about when I uh, think of innovations that have come out of Africa that I love talking about is in the banking industry, and I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about M-Pesa and the impact that it's had. M-Pesa came out of Kenya and till today remains admirable. For those who don't know, it's a platform that enables people to exchange airtime for goods and services and even money. A decade after its launch, M-Pesa has expanded to 10 countries. It boasts 29.5 million active users and processes up to 614 million transactions per month. An MIT study published in 2016 revealed that M-Pesa is responsible for lifting 2% of households in Kenya out of poverty. Now, if you want an impact figure, think about this. That is equivalent to over 250,000 families who now no longer live below the poverty threshold of less than a dollar a day in Kenya. I'm just leaving that with you all as just one example of the great things that can happen when we come together. We have already started that journey ourselves and believe that we will have even greater success stories and a legacy that we will all remain proud of, all of us partners here, in the years to come. I'm asking you to please fly as high as you all possibly dare. We are all here rooting for you, cheering you on, and absolutely believe in you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and again, we thank you for supporting us at Leap Africa. Congratulations again to all the winners and award recipients today. It has, thank you, it has truly been an insightful and an incredible event. I would like to thank everyone who joined us physically and especially virtually for engaging and staying up until this point. Can we please celebrate our online audience, please? Thank you. And invariably, you're celebrating yourselves. Thank you so much. Congratulations, especially to Leap Africa on celebrating 20 years of existence. Congratulations on your 20th anniversary. It has been such an interesting journey. We will send a survey to our online participants and virtual attendees and other highlights from this event and would appreciate your feedback. It's been our pleasure hosting this event today. Did you have a good time? Yeah. Did you learn a lot? Come on, a round of applause for yourself one more time. Thank you very much. And, and for all our speakers, our distinguished speakers and panelists, panelists, a round of applause. Thank you. And for our outgoing fellows too. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Emenao. My name is Mojibade Shosoya. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you next year. And to, take, and to close and give us a vote of thanks, please, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Chief Operating Officer of Leap Africa, Kendi Ayeni. A round of applause for her as she comes to take the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for spending your day with us. We've had such an amazing day, very enlightening. Um, there's so much that has been said in this room from how Henry started his conversation to the panel and of course closing from our very dear partner and friend Sahara Foundation and group. We are very grateful to Union Bank. We are very grateful to Vanessa Garrison as well. Very grateful to our online guests, all our board members who made it into the room in spite of their heavy schedules. I must say that Mrs. Amashe is holding a delegation from across Africa, but she has prioritized us today and we are very grateful. Our team, please come up. We want to thank all the people who have worked 
alongside all the amazing things you've seen today to make it happen. We also want to share with you our very personal song, the lip song that will be. Please come up on stage. Don't mind, I'm still speaking. Please hurry up. It would be nice to just um, take a bow with you all. Very grateful for the nights and days that you have put into this. Very grateful for the hardworking fellows. This is more than an event. This is more than an activity for us. It's something that taps into our individual collective work as a group. So thank you so much to the LEAP team. Thank you to our partners, Union Bank, and everyone in the room. Gift, when you're ready, please come for the microphone as we usher the event to a wonderful and beautiful close. Thank you. Shine the light, inspired with hope. We're strong for the change that we know. Prepared for a curse, our voice we raise louder than ever. Always shine a light. You can join us and sing. It's a very simple song. to the end of this very beautiful conference we hope to catch you online please continue the conversations it doesn't end here we have to keep it going thank you all the fellows and Sahi so happy to see you after so many years Damien so happy to see you oh uh, Daniel thank you so much Mojibade thank you so very much the, the thanks keep going on and on so much gratitude in our hearts thank you to our partners and friends all those who can make it thank you
last hope for 